I don't know where the hell I am at this point. We're trudging through all these Bowie albums. What's up, everybody? Welcome back to Taste Like Music. Jason, Joe, and Crams are here. If this is your first time watching the channel, what we do here basically is cover a different artist every single week rank all of their studio albums on Tuesday. We also give you our top 10 songs on Wednesday. And then we have a third discussion on Thursday inspired by the artist at hand. We've got a big one this week. Today we are talking about David Bowie. So be sure to hit the like button, subscribe to the channel if you've not done so yet, hit the bell for notifications. And here we go, David Bowie. This is a big one. One of the biggest artists we've done in a minute. I don't think uh, there should be a whole lot of controversy, at least in terms of liking the artist or not. I think we're all on board with David Bowie, but ranking these records was tough. Um, 27 albums that we're counting. Basically the core records we are counting. We are not counting the Tin Machine records. Since you guys have joined the channel, we've been pretty pretty much sticklers for sticking to things with the band name. And you know, we didn't count Heaven and Hell for Black Sabbath, which had all the same members as a different Black Sabbath record. But it's gotta be the artist in name for us to count it. I have ranked Bowie before, back before you guys joined the channel. I counted the Tin Machines then. Uh, we're tossing those out, but we are adding two which i didn't count which is the buddha of suburbia soundtrack and the toy record which was released uh basically re-recordings of some old singles and stuff so we're back to 27 how much of the 27 did you guys know before the week first of all love bowie this was an awesome week so much fun grew up with bowie pretty much knew everything. I I feel bad because everyone in the Discord was like, I don't know how you guys do it, 27 albums and you're going to listen to all of them twice. I'm not going to lie. I didn't really have to go back and re-listen to about 10 or 11 of these because I just know them so well. I mean, a lot of these albums I've listened to at least 20 or 30 times in my life all the way through. I did not know any of the 90s stuff minus Outside. And I did not know um, Hours or Heathen. I did know Reality. Um, And obviously Black Star and Next Day I knew as well. I did not know Buddha of Suburbia and Toy, obviously. So yeah, pretty much knew like 19 or 20 of the albums going in and most of those very, very well. Well, I'm not a Bowie virgin by any means, but I didn't, I have not heard nearly as many as you do. Um, I had not heard any of the 90s stuff outside of Black Tie, White Noise, nothing basically between that and Black Star. So I kind of skipped that whole era. I was, I'm, I'm really, well, I should say I was really a classic Bowie period. Give me um you know space oddity to let's dance know that period very well everything kind of outside that is a hit or miss i probably heard um little snippets and bits but not whole albums really um so this was a, a treat for me interesting experience to get to know the rest of its catalog all right and like i said i've ranked them on the channel before i've listened to them all i know the vast majority of them very very well except for the two new ones that we're adding in. I'd never listened to Toy before, and I'd never listened to Buddha of Suburbia before, so those are new for me. And to be clear, we always have some people saying, how can you rank them if you've never heard them? We've spent the last two weeks getting to know them all, so we're, we're up to speed, all right? Uh, we are going to do a bottom five, then we're going to do rounds of four until we get to the top 10. And then we'll go individually for the top 10 and talk in a bit more detail. Uh, who's starting? I'll start this one. I, I've seen some people say that Bowie has no bad records. I don't know if that's true or not, because there's a couple here 
that I'm not too fond of. Nothing crazy. No way. I'm not putting low down here or anything. I know everyone expects me to come up with some ridiculous rankings. But I am going to put one that Jason had a lot higher the first time for some reason. At number 27, I got Never Let Me Down, which was a huge letdown, massive letdown. Um, you think 80s Bowie, you know, Let's Dance, but he, he would get much worse than that. Just real boring. Uh, Peter Frampton comes in on guitar and that, come on, that's a huge step down from Fripp and, you know, Stevie Ray Vaughan. So it, it's just boring, lacks any personality, any edge, not, not any good. Uh, Bowie would call this his Phil Collins years, and I think he's right. Two and a half stars. It's uh, just not a not a fun listen. Number twenty six. I got tonight. Uh, this was produced mostly by Bowie and Hugh Haddam, who did Phil Collins' stuff. He basically invented the big drum sound on In the Air Tonight. And this one kind of sounds again a little bit like Phil Collins, but not even close to is interesting. Like this seems like one of those lost records that uh, people don't really talk about for good reason. I think the first track, Loving the Island's pretty decent, but then you have like these kind of like flaccid reggae numbers. One of the worst um, duets I think I've ever heard, him and Tina Turner. Tina Turner is down so low, she might as well not even be on the track. It's really bizarre. Uh, God only knows, I didn't hate. Uh, I know it's going to upset some people because people do I think people have said this is like one of the worst um, covers ever. I thought it was fine. God only knows travels. Anybody can pull it off. I think uh, it's that good of a song. And uh, but other than that, pretty lame. No SRV. No Nile Rogers. It's it's lacking. Two and a half stars. Uh, number 25, I got The Next Day. I feel like this one could grow on me, but I don't know. This one feels so of its time, so 2013, so like TV on the radio. Just, I don't know. I, I think more it's about the style he's doing other than, you know, rather than the quality of the record because I just can't get into it. It doesn't, it could be the greatest produced immaculately written album of all time. If it sounds like this, I don't like it. So two and a half stars for that. Number 24, I got Buddha of Suburbia. It was kind of interesting. There's some like jazzy instrumentals in here. It's a little weirder. Uh, Sex in the Church had some weirdness to it. A little uncomfortable. Um, title track's pretty good. But other than that, once you get through that, it's pretty, pretty average. I don't know, three stars. It wasn't terrible. I, I didn't hate it. I just, you know, nothing really stayed with me after it was done. And finally, another one that I feel like I didn't spend enough time with, uh, but I have Earthling at 23. Three stars again. It's got, you know, the big drums, the, the jungle sound, drum and bass, electronic textures. Felt like a little bit of a lighter, like Nine Inch Nails. I think Bowie sounds really good still. I think his voice is still strong here and some interesting guitar work, but the songs themselves I thought were just average. So three stars, it, it's tough because you go through like this greatness period where everything is just awesome. And it's so hard to compare once you get to the nineties and two thousands with the classic period. So maybe these are a little harsh, but I'm still at three stars for, for Earthling, but it could grow, you never know. So I feel like I, as I usually do have had several fairly controversial rankings in my original video, but the one that really seemed to upset everyone was the thing that I had at the bottom and it is still at the bottom. I have outside from 1995 last. I think it's a rare case of a Bowie album feeling a little bit calculated throughout his career. He always seems like he's doing whatever he wants, even when he's doing straight pop on like let's dance. It's because he wants to be doing that. This, I, I don't know, this record feels a little calculated, like you got this big concept, bringing Eno back. It feels like a really, you know, concentrated effort to uh, regain his critical standing. All the spoken word bits and all the semi-industrial production don't do it any favors. I don't think the songs are very interesting. 
it's not a horrible record by any means. It's perfectly listenable, uh, just not one I'm going to go to very often. Two and a half stars for outside. People were also upset about my number 26 before, but it is no longer number 26 because uh, we have introduced Buddha of Suburbia into the equation. That is my 26. I think the opening track is pretty good. Sex in the Church, though, sounds really dated, really bad production. The bass sounds on this record are really terrible. There's a lot of synth bass, and I don't know. The sound's not working for me. The album does hit a little bit of a stride, like the back, like the third quarter of the record. There's a few songs in a row that are pretty decent, but I don't know, all the more like ambient instrumental type of stuff before that section of the record is really, really boring. Uh, so two and a half stars for me on that one. That's when we get to the record that I had second to last before, and that is Earthling uh, from 1997. I think based on that, you can tell pretty much what my least favorite era of Bowie is. It is the early to mid 90s, not really into the electronic stuff, the industrial jungle, whatever it is. I'm not a big fan of it. Again, I don't know. He seems to be playing up the uh, relationship with Trent Reznor a bit. And I don't know. I, it doesn't feel like authentic Bowie really to me. I think the songs on this are, are much, much better than they are on outside. There's some really good songs. I like Little Wonder a lot. Uh, Dead Man Walking, Telling Lies, I'm Afraid of Americans. I just wish it had different production. I, I would love to hear those tracks with, with production more like what he was doing in the early aughts instead of what's happening here. The really frenetic drum beats, the break beats or whatever they are, just I, I can't stand them. The guitars are really noisy. I don't know. It just seems kind of hell-bent on giving you a headache. So because the songs are better, though, I'll, I'll go three stars on this one. And that's it for three stars. From here on out, we are up to three and a half. Tons of good records. So I am all in on Bowie. Loved it. Number 24, I have The Next Day. I think there's a big leap in quality between the bottom three and this one. I don't know. I, I feel like the songwriting here is just a little bit on the middling side. Nothing here I really, really love. Uh, the production's a little plain. I mean, it sounds good sonically. I just, there's not a lot of excitement happening. I do think though that it's a very cool um, guitar record. There's a lot of really cool guitar leads. Uh, Jerry Leonard, Earl Slick, Brian Thorne all play guitar and there's a, a lot of really great guitar work. I just find the songs on this one a little bit boring and it's pretty long, 53 minutes, three and a half stars. Good record, not great. 23, I've got Heathen. This was his highest charting record since tonight. Um, it's his first record in over a decade without Reeves Cabral. I think it starts out really strong with, you know, a bunch of really good tracks in the first half. Sunday is really cool opening with that, like really atmospheric electric guitar sound. And then the beat finally dropping in later in the track. It's really awesome. Other tracks like uh, Slip Away and Slow Burn are great. Afraid is really cool. Uh, the back half, though, I, I feel like uh, it isn't as strong. Again, a good record. Enjoy it a lot, but he's got better. I'm pissed, first of all. I ordered a David Bowie Ziggy Stardust makeup kit that was supposed to be here by the time for this shoot. It did not arrive. I will be writing a strongly worded letter. Um, otherwise, I'd be in full Bowie makeup. My number 27, I can't believe neither of you guys have this in the bottom of five, especially Jason. I've got black tie, white and noise, and I've got it at two stars. I think it's pretty, pretty poor. It's the only Bowie record I think is less than average. It's really embracing the early 90s dance pop sounds, a lot of instrumentation that I don't really care for. I don't think, you know, he sings too well on it, or at least it clashes with the vibe of the production going for like this, like octung baby kind of mess you know whole album's just really messy miracle good night is a really bad song and it's just too long number 26 we're on up to 2.5 which is my decent territory not something i'll really revisit i've got never let me down i'm with joe here day in day out is okay but much like the rest of the album it's just not his best and is overproduced to death sounds like he's trying to do a lot of like 
Prince imitations here. And if there's one thing Bowie doesn't really need to do, it's imitate other things. You can always be a chameleon and absorb and saturate into new stuff, but it really sounds like at times he's trying to be Prince. Time Will Crawl is an absolute mess of a song. Um, but it's not a total lot lost cause. I think Zeros is actually a great song and pretty cool. And I like what's happening with Glass Spider and some of those ideas that never really get flushed out too much. My number 25, kind of with Joe again here, 2.5 stars for tonight. Also shocked this was not at the bottom of Jason's given all of the pretty lousy reggae um, influence painted on here. Joe's right, loving the alien is the best thing about it, but too many covers that are pretty weird. Don't Look Down is like this wannabe reggae police kind of track. Neighborhood Thread is cool. Other than that, not a whole lot to grip here. My number 24 is the debut, 2.5 stars, David Bowie. It's decent. You know, it's kind of hard for me to put my finger on. It's got like this old English kind of charming storytelling to it. But in the, you know, the Baroque elements are really nice. The lyrics are fun. You know, I love him talking about his mustache back in the day on Rubber Band. Very cool. But I don't think it has a lot of stuff other than his character. Like, I don't think it has the music that you know with Bowie. It's not glam rock. It's not inventive. It's not super creative. The arrangements aren't really there. It's kind of falls flat for me. And then at number 23, I'm at two and a half stars. And this is my last two and a half stars. After this, we'll be at three stars and up, which means good for me and recommended. And this one's close to three. And I like a lot of stuff Jason had to say about it. I'm talking about Earthling here, people. Um, it starts off with Little Wonder, which is kind of cool. It's got this weird like techno Brit pop infusion that I'm not crazy about, although it's, sometimes it does work. And there are elements on this album that I like, but the drums and the percussion just kill everything. It's constant cluttering of drum noise and the, like everything sounds like it's like in a late 90s action movie car chase through Prague. The entire thing is like, it's like, just calm down. I'm Afraid of Americans makes it on this album, which is a great song, um, but it's not quite, you know, the, 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 the drums and everything. It's, it's too much. It's too much techno. Change that. Maybe you got a three star good album here, but that's it. Number 23, Earthling. After that, we're only talking about good recommended albums. 22 good recommended albums from me for Bowie. That is a pretty good ratio, my friends. Well, I'm not not quite at that level. I don't. I wouldn't. Wouldn't you know dissuade someone from listening to some of these albums? But we're still not in the territory where I'm going to recommend any of these, other than maybe a cursory listen. Of course, if you're following along with us, then you do have to listen to everything. So get cracking. There's a lot. Number twenty-two. I'm going back to the debut. Uh, David Bowie, the first David Bowie, not the second David Bowie. This one it feels like a like a Grimm's fairy tale kind of thing. Like the music is kind of like childlike and playful. And the lyrics are like darker and like there's some weird stuff going on. Like it, it's it's kind of baroque pop, but like there's this kind of perversity like to the lyrics that kind of unnerving. It it's kind of cool. Uh, like coming by my toys and love you till Tuesday. Um, it's just, I don't know. There's just something missing, I think, because he, he sort of pulls it off. Like he's like a little sprightly kind of happy go lucky. But I don't know. There's just something too weird about it. And it doesn't really stand up to like the other Baroque pop uh, stuff from around the same time. So it's, it's good that he changed from that style going forward. I think that was kind of a dead end. Number 21, I got Hours. This was kind of his back to basics, I guess, after all the electronic stuff. Uh, it's softer, a little more adult contemporary sounding, a little more, you know, 90s, not alternative, but, you know, nothing out there. There's no like jungle beats or, you know, nine inch nails, aping kind of stuff on here. And it's just okay. It's, it's three stars. Um, I just don't think the songwriting is that interesting and there's nothing here that you know you can't find somewhere else in his catalog number 20 i'm gonna go outside and this is this is an interesting record because i think it sounds great there's some cool ideas i think a small plot of land 
uh, has some really cool guitar stuff going on, like almost Alex Lifeson flavored. Hello, Space Boy. Got these great synths, like skittering kind of percussion on it. And I really like the way this sounds, like the whole album sounds great. Uh, it's you know produced by Brian Eno. But like you get the little segues, there's a bunch of ambient stuff that doesn't quite work. I think you could find a four star album here, probably if you like really cut it down, like got down to the, the meat of it. Cause I think it sounds pretty cool. Like the Heart's Filthy Lesson uh, has some great like Nine Inch Nails uh, style synths and stuff. But it just, the way it's, they put it together on an album just doesn't quite work. It's, it's almost, almost very good. And I have it at three stars still, but it's, it's closer to three and a half and three. And number 19, uh, I'm going to go with the newest one, Toy. I think it starts out really poorly. Um, and I guess that's because like the earliest tracks are his earliest work. So um, I dig everything. You've got to have it leaving. Really don't grip me at all. Really kind of boring. So it kind of takes you right out of the groove there at the beginning. I got a little scared. I thought this would be at the bottom. Uh, but then it, it starts to pick up as you kind of go through his, you know, early years. You get in like the Ziggy Stardust stuff. Uh, you got Shadow Man, Karma Man, um, Conversation Piece has a nice orchestral arrangement, some great background vocals. And Let Me Sleep Beside You is like this kind of bird's jangle to the guitar. And I think pretty much everything else, you know, Hole in the Ground, Baby Loves That Way, Can't Help Thinking About Me, Solids, Tunes. I don't love the way it's like done with like the modern production. Like I, it really leaves me wanting to hear it like from 1970 with you know Mick Ronson on guitar. Um, and I think that's kind of what holds it back from being like a, a great album. I do like Toy, Your Turn to Drive a lot. Uh, kind of mid nineties, alt rock sounding. I think that one probably shows its age the best. I think it was later written and produced. Pretty solid, three and a half stars, but it just leaves me wanting a little bit more with the, the production and the way it was done with like modern kind of technique and everything. All right. Toy is my number 22. Like Joe just said, a bunch of re-recordings of early singles and B-sides of his. Um, he intended to record it and just like very quickly do it and release it like immediately. But uh, there were some like record label issues and it ended up getting backed up and shelved so comes out later after his death but i don't know i think it's i think it's great um and i think it goes to show that my love of 60s and 70s pop isn't entirely about the sound of the production because i think the melodies are just like so light and airy it's just like effervescent pop and bowie sounds really energized uh, i don't think he's really sounded this energized since the 80s I really like I Dig Everything. I also really like Karma Man, Conversation Piece. You've got a lot of his usual players on this record, Garson and Slick and Gail Ann Dorsey, Sterling Campbell on drums, but their playing is like extra great here. They're just kind of going off. I think the whole band sounds fantastic. Uh, really good record, three and a half stars. Might be even higher though. If it, if it felt more like a proper record, it does feel like just like, songs from everywhere it doesn't make a lot of sense as like a straight through listen but i enjoy the vast majority of the tracks uh number 21 i've got tonight this was received a mixed kind of lukewarm reviews upon release and i think it's critical standing has not improved much usually near the bottom of a lot of bowie lists but i think there's plenty to enjoy on this record loving the alien is i think an excellent opener I like Don't Look Down's like really dark, jazzy pop. I think that's a really cool track. Then you get the most controversial track on the record, which is his cover of God Only Knows, which people absolutely hate. It is one of my favorite covers of any song ever. I absolutely love his version of it. It doesn't match the Beach Boys, which is my favorite song of all time. But man, I, I think Bowie's version is phenomenal. Then after that, you get to the kind of weak part of the record, the end of side one and the start of side two. Don't care for the reggae feel of the duet with Tina Turner. And I think Neighborhood Threat feels like just kind of like a throwaway rocker, just like banging out in 10 minutes and never think of it again. Uh, but then you get 
to the back half, which has some good stuff. Blue Jean, I think, is right up there with uh, some of the stuff from Let's Dance. I think it's a great 80s single. I think, you know, he set the bar insanely high for himself, not only with with quality of songs, but the innovation. So I think when he doesn't reinvent himself on a record, it, people feel a little let down. And, you know, that's what this record is. It's not a reinvention. He's not doing anything new here. But I do think a lot of the songs are are quite good. So three and a half stars. My number 20 is Black Star. Uh, so people all know the story of Black Star by now. He released it on his birthday in 2016. Two days later, he died. And instantly, like the recognition and praise for this record just went through the roof. And I think there's a lot of really cool stuff on it. Some of these songs are amazing. I really enjoy the uh, incorporation of some of the jazzy elements uh, that he was kind of inspired by listening to Kendrick Lamar. And I think those elements come through in the record really well in a really cool way. Black Star, Lazarus, and Dollar Days, I think, are three of his best tracks from his later period. Really great stuff. Those songs deserve all the praise they get. Uh, unfortunately, I don't think the entire record is of that same quality. I do not like Sue or In a Season of Crime at all. He's back to using those break beats. He's got like one or two of these tracks on every record basically since Outside. And he just can't seem to let them go. And it's really prevalent on this track. But also, the riff is just that incessant, like, I don't know, there's nothing to it. It's, I just... It's very grating. I don't like that song. The other three tracks, I think, are in the middle. They're okay tracks, uh, pretty decent. It's a good record. It's overrated, but it's a good record. Three and a half stars. And number 19, it's Black Tie, White Noise. I had them in this order the first time I did it. I had Black Star, Black Tie, White Noise ahead of it, but I had it at like 13 and 12 or something like that. I had them both a little bit higher on the list. So I, th I thought that would be my hottest take by far, but people were more upset by me putting Outside Last. This record has some of the same cheesy synth bass that Buddha of Suburbia has. They both came out in 93. But I think the context of it here works much better. He's doing like a, an R&B pop thing. And I, I don't know, the sound just works on this record. It sounds kind of like Ace of Bass, Mariah Carey, Boys the Men, whatever else he's doing. I don't know. It's it's a weird dichotomy on this record between being poppy, but him also like pulling in another direction. There was a lot of tension between him and Nile Rogers, I think, making this record where Niall was brought in and he wanted to, you know, basically try to make another Let's Dance. But Bowie, I think, felt pressure to, to bring Niall in and didn't really actually want to go in that direction and wanted to do something a little weirder. So there's like this push pull on this record that I think is kind of interesting. I love the title track with I'll Be Sure. You've Been Around has some great guitar work on it from Reeves Gabrell. And I think it really picks up steam in the back half with Miracle Goodnight, Don't Let Me Down and Down, which I think is an incredible R&B pop ballad. And his cover of I Know It's Gonna Happen Someday, I think is amazing too. I just love Bowie doing covers. I think he's a, a great interpreter of songs. His voice is really good on it. Uh, I think it's a majorly underrated record. It's only number 19, but I'm up to four stars already. All right. Yeah, there's some pretty hot takes there. Let's settle this God Only Knows thing once and for all. It doesn't deserve the hate it gets by any means. It's fine. And you're right. He's usually pretty good at covers. Saying it's a tremendous cover, I think, is a little bit wrong. But there's no touching the best song of all time. My number 22, I'm up to three stars. Good albums, recommend all of them. I got Toy, the new one, the reimagining of the old tracks. I think this, this is interesting because the band is pretty hot here. I think they're pretty lively. Their playing is great, but it's got a bit of a bland sound. There's not a whole lot of um, imagination going on. It almost feels like, mid 90s like tom petty records where it's just like this is like his most american sounding record i would say pretty easily the band is a big focus but there's some really cool gems here like the version of shadow man and let me sleep beside you hole in the ground pretty cool yeah guitars are like really electric and wirely wiry um it's just not the sound and the motivation i really want in a david bowie record 
My number 21, three stars. I've got David Bowie or Space Oddity or David Bowie 2. Obviously, lead off is amazing. It's fun, raucous energy and like unwashed and slightly unfazed. Pretty cool. Letter of Hermione is great. Kind of warm. Pretty late 60s sounding album. Acoustic guitar driven, even folksy at times. Certainly with occasional dream. Love how the album ends. It's a big step in the right direction for him. Number 20, going with pinups. Simply put, a lot of pretty darn good covers. End of story. You let Bowie sing and imagine things. I think C. Emily is probably the best one. Really dig his uh, version of the Who's I Can't Explain. It's not his best mechanism for his artistry to do a whole covers album, but be lying if I said it didn't sound good, because it does. Number 19, three stars for Heathen. Sometimes referred to as like his 9-11 album. It's a very dark, reflective, kind of moody album. Very gray, sometimes a bit too tedious at times. Um, I think it's overly challenging. I think he just kind of took a step back from a lot of these songs. Let them breathe a little bit. Simplified it. Be cool. I think the cover of Pixie's Cactus is really good. Slip Away is pretty great. I think the songs and arrangements are a little bit basic for him at times, but no doubt some really good tunes on it. All right. That's the, I think we're all pretty good so far. I haven't seen too many egregious hot takes, although I am concerned that Jason hasn't put Never Let Me Down yet, so I'm just going to circle that one. Uh, my 18 is going to be Heathen. It's going to be number one, I know it. Uh, number 18, Heathen. Uh, I think this is a pretty decent album, three and a half stars. I think it's much better than ours. Uh, I like Matt Chamberlain's drumming on it. I think he does a good job. Always good to see him. Uh, you got Tony Visconti and a bunch of guitarists, Carlos Alomar, Gary Leonard, Tony Levin shows up to play bass on a track. Uh, Pete Townsend is on Slow Burn and Dave Grohl shows up too. So a bunch of guest stars, Jordan Rudess from Dream Theater plays keyboards on some stuff. And I think the melodies on here are much stronger than they have been pretty much throughout the 90s. I think it's a good step in the right direction. Cactus, Pixie's cover is great. Uh, I think the Neil Young cover is pretty good. I think the first half is much better than the second half. I kind of lose, lose it a little bit once it gets to like, uh, took a trip on Gemini Spaceship. Uh, but Heathen, The Rays, the final track, kind of brings it back. So uh, three and a half stars for me on this one. I thought it was pretty good. Number 17, I'm going to go with Pinups, the old cover album, the only 70s, well, the, the first 70s album showing up on my list. I think these are all pretty good covers. I heard some people talking smack on the cover of C. Emily Play, but I, that's my favorite track on the whole album. I think it's great. I love the, the weird double track vocals on it, like kind of creepy. I actually prefer it over the Pink Floyd version. I uh, hate to say that, it's gonna be some hate. Uh, but, you know, having, you know, the, the spiders from Mars there, I think helps uh, Mick Ronson and everybody sound pretty good. Number 16, uh, a little higher than most people, I believe, but I got black tie, white noise. This is an interesting one. I, I liked it. Uh, one point it was at four stars. I dropped it back down to three and a half. Um, but I, I kind of like the way he's taken like the New Jack swing, the synth bass. Uh, the title track I think is fantastic with I'll Be Sure. Them trading vocals is great. It kicks off with an instrumental, which is almost always a bad idea. But I think this one's pretty good. Kind of the Middle Eastern kind of feel you get. I believe it was because he had just married Iman, the supermodel, and kind of integrating different sounds. You got the Middle Eastern, the, the American sort of New Jack swing. So interesting album. Some stuff works better than others. I think the best track on it might be the Morrissey cover. I know it's going to happen someday. Really kind of big and gospely. Really great. Number 15, I'm going to go with Bowie 2, aka Space Odyssey, 
think it has some other name that people call it too. Most people call it Space Oddity. Space Oddity, I think so, right? But I don't know. I, this one always confuses me, the album name. Uh, besides the title track, which is kind of grandiose, very, you know, what the future would hold with something like Z Stardust, that one's phenomenal. One of the great tracks of the 60s, magnificent. Nothing else quite lives up to that, and that kind of is the problem. Very kind of folky, you know, some Bob Dylan influence. He's he just, I don't think he knows what he wants to be yet. But I think he would get it. Like he's, he's almost there. But he needs to add a little bit more to it. That's kind of where he would become on Hunky Dory. Uh, but on this one, it's just nice. Like it's, it's nice, folky, acoustic guitar driven rock. There's some good songs on here. But uh, nothing stellar, nothing spectacular other than the uh, Space Oddity. All right. Joe, you can rest easy. My number 18 is Never Let Me Down from 1987. Uh, it was pretty commercially successful, the record and the tour were, but they were not well received critically. And I don't think fans were too pleased either. Too Dizzy has been deleted from all of the reissues. So I had to go find that one elsewhere online and listen to it. Um, the biggest criticism for this record is usually the production, which is very 1987. It's overdone, but only in the same way that everything in 1987 was overdone. And I actually like the sound of 1987, as we discussed in our 1987 Songs of the Year video. It's a really kind of kitchen sink approach, but I think the songs are really strong pop songs day in, day out. I like Time Will Crawl. The title track I think are all great singles it's it's always weird to me that tonight falls between let's dance and this because this to me feels like a more natural follow-up to let's dance I don't know it's more of a pure pop in its approach than tonight was again I think you know he's not reinventing the wheel so people are a little let down by it but I think you know if you're comparing it to only other David Bowie records Maybe I can see the argument, but I, if you're comparing it to other pop music of the time, I think it's really strong and a really good record, and I've got it at four stars. Number 17, I have Pin Ups, the first appearance of a 70s album in my ranking. Um, it's a stopgap covers album, basically just buying himself some time with the record label. You know, I think it's good for what it is, and, you know, it's a covers record. We always get one of these in these big discographies. Interestingly, the band recorded a version of um, the Velvet Underground's White Light, White Heat during these sessions, and they didn't put it on the record. And Bowie donated that track to Mick Ronson for his solo album, Play Don't Worry. And I've always said that that was my favorite version of the song. I didn't realize until this week that it was recorded during the pinup sessions. So that's pretty cool. Here Comes the Night is Great, Friday on My Mind, Where Have All the Good Times Gone, Anyway, Anyhow, Anywhere, I think are all great. But for me, the big highlight is not See Emily Play, but Sorrow, his cover of the track uh, by The Mercies. I think he really takes that song to a whole other level than the original. I mean, it's kind of thrown together. And the, the spiders were in the midst of falling apart at the time. So I think it's kind of a cool snapshot of the end of the glam era. Really cool, enjoyable listen. Also four stars. 16, the debut, David Bowie. Heavily orchestrated 60s pop with touches of kind of a little bit of like Sid Barrett era, Floyd and psychedelia thrown in. It's interesting to me that he didn't really stick with this style for very long because I think compared to the other stuff in the era, it's right up there with the best of it. I think it's really good. He could have easily found his, his place in that genre. I think it's really hard to place in his discography trying to rank it among the other ones because there's not much else to compare it to. And I think the quality of it far outweighs its importance. So it's kind of hard to, to balance those things. The track Rubber Band is really cool. That's the track that got him the deal with Durham Records. Sell Me a Code, I think, is a really lovely tune. Love You Till Tuesday, super catchy. Probably like the most 60s sounding thing ever. Uh, there's a, a little bit of silliness in the kind of like weird news report thing at the beginning of We Are Hungry Men. 
When I Live My Dream, I think is a really beautiful ballad, great strings and horns. Bowie sounds really pure and clear on that track. I really like Made of Bond Street too, love the accordion on it and the kind of brush drums. Bowie and his bass player on this record wrote the arrangements using a music theory textbook and basically just fumbling their way through learning how to do that. And I think considering that, I think the, the string arrangements on it are really cool and creative and interesting. Uh, the other interesting note about this record is that it was engineered by Gus Dudgeon, who people will know as the guy who produced a bunch of Elton John records. Uh, my number 15, oh, I didn't say that one, is also four stars. My number 15 is the second record, David Bowie or Space Oddity, depending on what country you're from. It's a little folkier and more psychedelic than the debut, a little less uh, rooted in pop. I don't think he's still quite found his sound on this one yet. A lot of the, the musical ideas here, I think are fairly derivative of other things going on at the time, but I think his voice is really, really distinct and strong. And I think, you know, he can bring, you know, a lot of liveliness and interest to otherwise kind of drab material. Rick Wakeman on it, playing keys, Tony Visconti on bass. Paul Buckmaster, another link to Elton John playing some cello on this record. Um, aside from the great title track, I really love Janine, really melodic, great bass playing on it, some good electric guitar leads. Memory of a Free Festival has a really be beautiful melody as well. Bowie's playing like the a chord organ on it, and it kind of slowly morphs into this like slow, slow clap, sing along type of thing at the end, which is really cool. Unwashed and Slightly Dazed, I think is a really good folky rocker. I think it's a really good record comparatively, though it's not quite as strong material wise, uh, nor is it really the sound he becomes known, known for. So I think it's a little less essential in his catalog, but still very strong, four stars. And that is it. I'm in three star territory. My rankings here, my three stars is good. Reality, my number 18. This one actually is an album that fell a little bit for me. I think a few years ago, it could have been flirting with, you know, like top 12, something like that. But for some reason, it doesn't quite do it for me as much as it used to. I do think New Killer Star is awesome. There's some cool covers on it compared to Heathen, which is the one before it. It's definitely warmer, more rocking. Heathen was kind of airy and light, and this one is more of just like a warm, vibrant rocker at, for the most part. I love She'll Drive the Big Car. Love the harmonica on that. Fall Dog Bombs, The Moon, a really cool like lo-fi indie guitar sounds on it. But I don't know. I remember there just being more standout tracks than this time. So it's fallen to number 18, but still a good album. My number 17, this is my first hot take. And I still like this album, but I'd say among the... 10 to 12, maybe 13 albums that David Bowie fans really, really love. This one, I think, is a bit overrated. I've got Lodger, three stars, number 17. Love the rest of the Berlin trilogy, but Lodger doesn't quite do it for me as much. I just don't think it's as exciting as his other material. Even the reviews were a little bit poor when it came out, which really, an interesting side note about Bowie is kind of the history of the reviews and the admiration, which almost get better over time for like certain albums, which is pretty cool. African Night Flight is one of my least favorite tracks in his catalog. You know, I just think it's an unusually dull Bowie record. Everything kind of falls flat. There's still good material on it. I'm only really talking about why I don't have it as a higher score. Red Sails, probably my favorite on it. Um, Boys Keep Swinging doesn't really do it for me. I don't know. I feel like it's just at times in limbo as to like, does he want to do something more like Heroes or more like Low? And he can't really decide what it's, where it falls in there and doesn't really hit for me. And that's it. Everything else is going to be a classic uh, take on Bowie Records. So you can hate me briefly, but you'll love me later. My number 16, I am up to 3.5 stars. We're talking about really good albums here. I've got The Man Who Sold the World. Rockin' right off the bat, a great guitar tone, boogie and bass, killer tumbling drums, black country rock is awesome. I love how he sings on Running Gun Blues. It's so quirky and cool. Album here is more fully formed than I think the ones before it. All the instrumentation and bells and whistles, especially on Savior Machine, really cool. Shook Me Cold is really heavy. 
almost sounds like Sabbath. Like it's unusually heavy for uh, Bowie here. It's pretty badass. Uh, title track rules, obviously, although I do prefer the Nirvana version. Not going to lie about that. Sorry, Jason. This album is just really good rock music, really good rock songwriting with his trademark kind of character and flair, making it interesting on top of all that. Not quite fully the full flushed imagination that he can pull off, but pretty darn good rock album. My number 15 is an album that I think you guys are underrating a little bit. And David Bowie himself is overrating because he said it was his favorite album, which is pretty dumb. But I've got the Buddha of Suburbia. Uh, I like the opener. It's got this very nice slick soft rock sound on it. Dramatic dance beat, experimental jam with a cool lead organ on Sex in the Church. I thought that was cool. Definitely some cool jazzier vibes on it. Mysteries is really beautiful ambient track. Dead Against It is also beautiful. I just think it's got really cool landscape to it. I mean, it is a soundtrack. Let's just keep mentioning that because it's a soundtrack. And he does it well. It's got this really freeing, existential beauty to it. Very fluid. It's got a very lonesome, reflective feel. And it just sounds good. Almost feels like goodbye, like in a weird way, but obviously it's not. Um, and I thought it was a pleasant surprise. Um, obviously one I had never heard before. I'm also much more a soundtrack, ambient kind of guy compared to you two. So it makes sense that neither of you would have it too high. But for me, I think it's really good. The best album David Bowie has. Sorry, David, no, but really good. Three and a half stars. It was a good find. I would have bet lots of money that I would have Lodger, the lowest of the three of us. So that's that's an interesting take. I figured with all the talking heads kind of miss of it, it would be higher. I'm trying to figure out why it's not speaking to me and I, as much. I mean, I still like it, but I just can't, can't figure it out. Can't do it. Interesting. Must secretly hate Adrian Blue. Well, I think we all know that's not the case. Right. Let's get going here. Number 14, and I'm up to four stars. So half of Bowie's albums I find excellent. Very good. Definitely worth listening to multiple times. I will go back. Um, rea realty? No, reality at my number 14. But I must admit, again, the cover prevented me from listening to this because I think it is just one of the worst covers, again, ever. Jason likes it, but it's just awful. It's so tacky and cheesy looking. It's a better cover than The Next Day, which was a pretty lazy cover. Well, I mean, he had some, some poor covers, but this one in particular, the, I just, I don't know. I saw it. I was like, nope, not going to listen, uh, which was a mistake on my part because it is a very good record. Uh, I think New Killer Star might be his best track since like Let's Dance, maybe. I, I really think it's awesome. It's a proper ass kicker. Uh, groovy and strange, like any good art rocker should be. Um, Pablo Picasso is way better than the Modern Lovers version. Let's just get that out of the way. I've got the, the the original sucks, but I think Bowie's is, is very good. Um, people will not like that. I like this one because it doesn't sound like he's like trying to, you know, get back to like past glories, but it still has like that 70s and 80s like feel to it. Like you can feel the fact that he's lived through that and he has that experience. Uh, so I, I think it, the whole album sounds really good. Never get old. I love the acoustic guitar, the background chorus that kind of swells when Bowie exclaims, never going to get old. I think it's a, a perfect touch. Uh, Loneliest Guy has some cool haunting piano. Looking for Water has some great uh, Fripp Blue style guitar. I don't know who has guitar on this. One of it's either Gary Leonard, Earl Slick, David Torn, or Mark Plotty. I have no idea which one. doesn't matter. It's a great take on sort of an old sound uh, from Bowie's catalog. And Days, I think, is a fantastic track. Cool, like hammering synth part that, like, it, it kind of has like a Fleetwood Mac, Lindsey Buckingham feel to it, which I really dig. Um, the, the George Harrison cover is okay, but I think as a whole, 
really good album, Four Stars. Number 13, this one may be a little controversial, and I feel like people think I'm going to have this way higher, but I don't. I have Let's Dance. Still four stars. I still think it's good. I know. Stevie Ray Vaughan, Nile Rogers, like it should be speaking to me. But outside of the singles, I just don't think there's much there. Uh, I love the way it starts. Modern Love, uh, just a fantastic opener with that really cool, muted, I don't know what Stevie Ray Vaughan's doing, but it's awesome. China Girl, uh, Let's Dance, Cat People, all great, all just at the top of Bowie's pop game. But everything else just doesn't quite do it to me. I don't dig Ricochet much. And I don't know, it just feels a little light compared to his like great 70s stuff. Um, outside the, the singles, um, and even Modern Love, like I love the way it sounds with the lyrics kind of always, they're not great. Like they seem kind of nonsensical, kind of throws me a little bit. And Cat People, probably better on the soundtrack version with the more synth to it. So I think it's a good album, four stars, but I think it's not quite as good as people want it to believe it is. Number 12, I'm gonna go with Black Star. I had it at four stars in 2016 and I'm keeping it there. I guess I understand like Jason a little bit. It's not like some people have it at five stars and in his top five or whatever. And I think that's a bridge too far. But as far as like post rock, which I think this really is in a lot of cases, uh, I think it's really good for the genre. I really like how jazzy and strange it is. I think the melodies and the hooks like take a long time to develop. And I definitely hear some like talk, talk, spirit of Eden, like that kind of, you know, not ambient, but like the soundscapes, definite connection there. Uh, I think vocally Bowie sounds great. The next day, I don't think he sounded very good. I think he sounds much better on this one. Um, and, you know, the horn work I think is great. They're so melancholy. It's kind of sad because it has like this funeral air to it, the whole proceeding and, you know, it, he died a couple of days after it came out. So, you know, he knew and he kind of like, this is his eulogy, I guess, to the world. Uh, I, I think Sue or in a season of crime is pretty cool. And uh, the March of Girl Loves Me, great. I think is a, a very good, as far as like 26 albums go in anyone's career, probably have this at the top or, you know, right near it. I don't think it gets much better than that. And my 11, uh, I think everyone knew this was coming. I wish I could have it higher because I'd love to talk about it in length, but low is going to be 11 for me. I think it's good. I think it's probably one of the most overrated albums of all time because people think it's like this magical, wonderful five-star perfect album. I just don't see it. Like I think people are projecting like what came after and what inspired it. And... I, the production is unbelievable. The drum sound, fantastic. It's one of the better sounding albums, I think, you know, maybe ever. Uh, but the songwriting just doesn't do it for me. And not even the ambient side. I think the first half, the shorter little snippets, I think they're fine, but I just don't get the hype considering what we just heard from Bowie for the last you know, five years and his greatness. Um, always crashing the same car is good. I love the baseline on Breaking Glass. Speed of Life is pretty good. Again, you're leading off the, the album with an instrumental, which is dumb. Um, and I, I don't mind the ambient side. I think it sounds pretty good. I like it better than the one on Heroes. But Sound and Vision doesn't do anything for me. Uh, Be My Wife, okay piano, but I think it's a bit of a trifle as far as lyrically and everything. So, um, I don't know i just think it's it's good it's four stars but it's i don't know I, I remember when i listened to this for the first time i was reading like rolling stone or something and i saw i was like oh a five star bowie album i've never heard and i listened to it hated it just didn't listen to bowie for like 10 years after that uh so it kind of turned me off then a little more mature now but i still think it's it's probably 
wildly overrated by most people. Still good album, still sounds amazing. Like it, you can put it on and just be like transported. But uh, as far as songs go, yeah. All right. So, Some surprises there. I thought for sure Let's Dance was a lock for your top five, at least. Interesting. All right. So these are the ones for me that are missing out on the top 10. I've got at 14 hours from 1999. This is the first Bowie album that I owned on CD. My dad had pretty much all the 70s records on vinyl, so it wasn't the first Bowie album that I ever listened to or or heard. So I was familiar, but this was the first one that like would go in my car and I would hear as I drove around and kind of lived with it a little bit. So that could have some, uh, you know, effect on me liking it a bit more than some people do. It does seem to be a fairly divisive record kind of splits people uh opens with thursday's child which is a really unique song in his catalog i don't think he has another track that really sounds like it it's got a little bit of an r&b feel to it he allegedly wanted to have tlc sing the backing vocals on it but uh the producer uh and guitar player reeves gabrell uh vetoed him on that idea I like Reeves Gabrell's guitar playing a lot on this record. Probably my favorite playing of his on any of the stuff he's done with Bowie, including the Tin Machine records. I think he plays some really cool stuff on this record. I also think the interesting thing about this record is it seems more more than almost any other Bowie record, like a singer-songwriter record. You've got some tracks that just start with like simple strumming guitar, like Survive and Seven. Kind of cool, kind of interesting. Uh, I mean, like I said, he very rarely wrote, seemed to write songs that way. So it's almost like by being more conventional on this record, it feels like one of his weirder records because he didn't really do that. Um, I think Something in the Air is great. He belts out a bit at the end, sounds really good. Survive is cool with some shredding leads from Reeves Gabrell. The Pretty Things Are Going to Hell, I think it's a really great rocker. Super hooky guitar lick on it. I think my favorite track on the record is New Angels of Promise. I love the way Bowie sounds on that track. It's really cool. I feel like uh, Anthony Gonzalez from M83 basically modeled his entire singing style off of that song. I think maybe upon first listen, it might seem a little bit basic to people, but I think further listening reveals how much nuance there is to it. I don't think I'd call it an essential Bowie record or like tell somebody to listen to it or or start with this one by any means. But I think if you're a fan of Bowie, I think there's a lot to get into. And I think it's definitely a grower. I've got that at four stars. All right, my number 13, controversial. I've got Heroes. This was the only record of the Berlin Trilogy recorded entirely in Berlin. You've got the very notable addition of Robert Fripp on guitar. For me, it's a hard record to figure out how much I like it. It's really dark and really dense. Some of the guitar work on it is simply awesome. The title track, and especially on Joe the Lion, just killer guitar work from from Fripp. Song-wise, though, I don't think it stacks up to either of the other Berlin records. Um... For as avant-garde as low is made out to be, I think it's quite hook-filled. Even the instrumental tracks, I think, have have kind of like a groove or like chord sequence that are kind of hooky. The songs here are very, I think, cool sonically, uh, but I don't think that the playing and the individual parts of the playing stick out as much or draw you in as much. Uh, The instrumentals especially are much more ambient. Some people are really into that. I struggle with that generally. Sense of Doubt, Moss Garden, Neo Colm uh, make up 13 and a half minutes of the record's 41 minute runtime. So it's a little too hard for me to like go too high on this. I like it and I love some of it. And I think the guitar playing on it is awesome. Uh, but four stars for me on that one. Number 12 is Reality, my favorite of his later period. I think it feels more like a full band effort than most Bowie albums do. I think the band is really in top form. And I don't know, it's kind of hard to pinpoint exactly why I like it so much, apart from the fact that I just think all the songs are really, really strong and memorable. The rhythm section on it is great. Tons of groove and feel on basically every track. 
I love New Killer Star, Pablo Picasso, Never Get Old. Looking for Water is awesome. Fall Dog Bombs the Moon, really cool. Apparently Bowie wrote that one in like 30 minutes. I think the ballads on it are really cool. Loneliest Guy and his cover of George Harrison's Try Some, Buy Some, I think are great and really show off his uh, newly smoke-free voice. He quit smoking before this record and I think he sounds really good on it. Again, another one of his records that I don't think you could describe as groundbreaking, but of his later ones, I think this one has the best tunes, the best arrangements, the best playing. I think it's just a, a really cool, solid record. And then my number 11, hard to keep it out of the top 10 because I love it. Young Americans. So Diamond Dog starts his transitioning away from glam a bit, but this is a very clear break from his old sound into full on what he called Plastic Soul. Uh, the title track, one of my favorite songs ever, David Sanborn, totally tearing it up on the sax, great backing vocals. I love the congas going on in the background. It's just pure 70s excess. I love every second of it. The drum sound on it is great. I don't know, though. The, the record doesn't really have anywhere to go but down, though, from, from that such high start. Um, but I do think it does so kind of elegantly with Win. I think a really cool slow burn type of tune with those really cool, like dreamy sax flourishes uh, that are run through some kind of effect. It sounds really cool. Uh, creates a really cool atmosphere. I think Bowie's voice is in top form on this record. I think it's a contender for one of his best vocal albums. He uses his full range from really low to really high. I, my, my criticism and this is hard. This It gets really hard at this point of ranking Bowie's records because I feel like I have to justify the placement of everything. I really, really like the record. I love it. Four and a half stars. But the reason it's not in the top 10 is just for my personal taste, it relies a little too heavily on groove. And he has other records that rely heavily on groove too, um, like Low and Station to Station. But I feel like when, when on those records, there's also very, very strong melody as well attached to those grooves. And I, I feel like on some tracks on this record, especially like Fascination and maybe even Fame to an extent, I, I don't feel like the melodies are that strong. And it's those are really just like groove tracks made for dancing. And I just don't like them as much as, you know, this, the tracks on the other 10 records, but I love it. I love Young Americans. I love Win. Somebody Up There Likes Me is awesome. Across the Universe is another great Bowie cover. So good. I think it's a really cool new direction. Unbelievable that this would be anybody's 11th best record. It's true. The placement of these albums in the lineup is just, it doesn't do it justice. Young Americans, Jason's 11th. Most other bands, one or two. Like, it's pretty awesome. All right. Number 14 for me, I've got Hours. I pretty much agree with everything Jason said. It's really cool how straight up it's just like, hey, I wrote this song with a guitar and it's recorded. I like kind of the Moby vibes off the first track. Really dig that. Yeah, straightforward, really good songs like Survive. Dreaming of My Life is great. Some refreshing, lively electric guitar on this album. Really awesome. Uh, I love the slide guitar on Seven. What's really happening is cool with the heavier guitar. I think it's an underrated guitar album in this catalog. It's weird. This came out in 99, but I feel like it's cool because it almost properly embraces a summary of all the rock movements of the 90s, like in parts. So it's just kind of like this was rock music in the 90s. And boom, it's pretty cool. Um, New Angel Promise is great. Dreamers is a great closer. Very close to four stars, but I've got it at 3.5. My number 13 is also an album I've got at 3.5, but very close to four stars. I'm going with Diamond Dogs here. Bit more out there sounding, far more experimental and creative than like Aladdin Sane and obviously Pinups. And it's starting to stray a little bit from glam rock, which is probably the right move given Mick Ronson was gone, and it's noticeable. Um, Rebel Rebel is great. You know, he's starting to really become a chameleon here. Diamond Dogs is a damn good song. His voice on this album is a little more masculine and more straight up rock and roll than it was on the previous albums. 
not quite as some of the oddness of those glammier albums that came before this was kind of lost on here. So I think it plays it a little bit safe. Uh, Sweet Thing, I think, is one of the more underrated songs in his catalog. I think it's gorgeous. Um, I like the way his voice kind of squeaks when he goes up and says, I'm scared. It's really, really touching. Starting to catch a glimpse of the more soul that's going to happen on Young Americans. So to me, I think it's a really good album, but a little bit in transition. And I think he's being a little cautious. So it's something he almost never does on any album. But I think you get it here a little bit, probably because Mick Ronson and company not really around. Uh, Rock and Roll With Me is heavily underrated. Really dig the piano part. It's just a really cool feel to a song and a great example of how good of a writer he is. Um, yeah, just it's not quite for because like Jason was saying, after Young Americans, for me, after Rebel Rebel, you never really get that height, that sensation you get the rest of the album. Number 12 I've got four stars here. So 12 four-star albums is quite a lot. Pretty impressive. That means great to me. I've got an album I was surprised neither of you liked too much. I've got The Next Day, which has some pretty cool of-its-time vibes, like those mid to 2010s kind of indie rock vibes. Not as tame as his 2000s output. The Stars is a really great track. Love is Lost is wonderful. Just really like the attitude and for all the reasons Joe doesn't like the sound of this album, I do. So it makes sense. It falls into our score sheet. I do think this is the most melodic and musical his albums have been probably since, I, I don't even know, a long time. Great leads with emotion and catchy choruses, memorable hooks. I really love the bass sound on this album too. It's really elastic and rubbery, like especially on Valentine's Day, which I think is a great song. If You Can See Me, really awesome drum lead rocker. Really reminds me of like old school Bowie with its odd nature. I think it's a really underrated album, four stars. And then the one, my number 11, pains me not to get this one in the top 10. Station to Station, um, which I predict will be Jason's number one. One of the problems it has is there's just simply not enough songs on it, which... When you love David Bowie, the more the merrier. And this one does rely on groove a lot, like Jason talked about when he was um, discussing um, Heroes or Young Americans, was it? Young Americans. To, it's arguably the best played album of his catalog. It's The band is mad hot on this album. It sounds so good. I think some of the songs are a little bit bloated, just a tiny bit, like the title track, even though it's great. Um, big different feel here on this album. The drums and bass are just on fire. Songs are really rolling along. TVC 15 is great. Well, the rhythm on this album is just tremendous. It's just something that detracts from me a little bit from it being a little bit higher. Songs are just played, like I said, perfectly so tight. There's this slippery, like storytelling nature in some of the songs too, like Warren Zevon style, really cool. So it's got that cool dynamic of having like this singer songwriter feel with this band just going crazy in the background getting some like kraut rock vibes on it you get the thin white duke thing with like some of his weird like nazi fascination like coming in a little bit at times not proponent of nazism just he was you know obviously liked reading about the history of it and why it happened or whatever album has a cool kind of manic quality to it which makes sense for his state of mind. Apparently at this time he was like 80 pounds and only eating green bell peppers and doing a lot of Coke, which is a diet I tried out for a good year or two and it didn't really work for me. My songs came out bad. Um, I, I just don't know what, there's like a small lack of communication between this album and me that doesn't get into like my, you know, four and a half or five star range or top 10. My favorite track on it is probably Stay. I think it's one of the best just rock songs of its time. Wild as the Wind is a little bit falls flat for me. The album just leaves me a little bit cold, but I think it's great. Four Stars is great. Eleven is great. We've done countless listographies where I don't have a four-star album, and this MFers got one, got two outside of the top ten. So we knew there was going to be heartache no matter what. We knew it. It's Jason's album of the year winner, and I predict maybe his winner for this whole damn thing. 
said before we started recording that I was fine with any order, basically. Like, it's so hard to rank them. You can do pretty much anything and defend it in some way, but that does hurt a little. I mean, you had Black Tie, White Noise right ahead of Black Star, which is preposterous to me, so. Doesn't, doesn't bother me. Nothing so far has really bothered me. Maybe the next day, so high. But, I mean, for Bowie, there's at least like 12 really good albums. Like it, uh, it's only the way that we're doing this format that makes it feel like the 11th album is just like light years behind number 10. False, very false. My 11 and 10, neck and neck. In fact, 11, 10 and nine. I, it was very hard to place them all. I had low in my top 10 at one point. I feel like I dropped it down just to annoy people, but I mean, it's so close, and I still think it's a good album. But I got Lodger at number 10. It's another, you know, it's part of the Berlin trilogy. It's another one where it's like half just magnificent and half like, oh, could have been better. Like if I could just like take the halves of the Berlin trilogy that I like the best, I could make like at least three five star albums out of them. But uh, I kind of agree with Kramzer, like African Night Flight, Yassassin. Uh, move on like the, the kind of world music influence I just don't think he does it great like it, it's okay uh, obviously influential on you know talking heads and later world music stuff but once you get to red sales I think things really start to pick up uh, I really like Adrian Belu's guitar work on this album I think it's fantastic uh, DJ I think is great Doing a little David Byrne imitation on that. Great funky beat, great vocal hook. Just a, a really good song. I like Blue's guitar on that. I think it's great on Red Sails. Look back in anger. Bowie's vamping all over the place with his vocals. It's got that jittery beat, the kind of dance rock almost. Uh, boys keep swinging. Another good pop song with this ridiculous squealing, screaming guitar solo. Um, and, you know, if you took away, like, Yassassin, maybe, if there's just, like, one or two too many that I don't want to listen to, like, I, I find myself just skipping through it, and that, it's kind of a problem when you're ranking whole albums, um, because half of the album, I think, is just phenomenal. But the other half, eh, I don't really want to listen to. So it's only going to be four stars, but um, I think it's pretty great. It has a very big influence. It's really cool sounding. Like all these records are so cool sounding. There's just like a couple choices that kind of mm, bug get me a little bit. So I don't know. Your mileage may vary, but I uh, got four stars. Very good album. Laja. All right. Top 10. My number 10 is The Man Who Sold the World. I think this is the first whiff you get of like classic Bowie, the first album with Mick Ronson and Mick Woodmansey. No Trevor Boulder yet. Tony Visconti plays bass on this record. And I think basically this record is not notable for having a much heavier rock and blues based sound than its predecessor. Uh, Mick Ronson said that he was trying to do something kind of on the level of cream. And moments on this record are almost even like proto metal at times. It opens with the awesome with the circle, which I think is just an incredible track. Ronson instantly makes himself known. Uh, Visconti's bass work too on this track and on the whole record is really killer. His bass tone is so fat and fantastic. All the Mad Men starts out kind of like a folky thing, something like off of Space Oddity. But when the band kicks in, there's just so much more muscle than he ever had before. It's really cool. Black Country Rock, like Cram said, is awesome. Super heavy bass tone. Great lead work from Ronson on it. She Shook Me Cold, I think, is one of Bowie's heaviest songs. Uh, just a, a great jam section on it that Mick Ronson just wails over. Of course, the title track is great. I think it's a great record. Like I said, it's a little bit like Cream, a little bit of like early Sabbath, but with touches of the early folky Bowie stuff thrown in, uh, still kind of lingering in the sound, which make it very interesting and, and different than the other sort of heavy rock going on at the time. I think it's really unique in his catalog, really cool. 
he'd never really do another straightforward rock record exact quite like this again. So, uh, yeah, I think it's really good. Four and a half stars. Nice review. I kind of get, um, you know, around the same time, like a little bit of 10 years after vibe on that album too. Um, all right. Top 10 favorite David Bowie records. 4.5 stars. Damn near classic. My number 10 is Heroes. It's futuristic and groundbreaking Brian Eno Berlin trilogy sound, just like low. But the songs are far more familiar, less avant-garde, more rooted in pop and rock. Um, you know, the tendencies. I kind of I kind of see what Jason was saying, where even though low, you know, has much more experimental tendencies and is a lot more just instrumentals. There are just little synth parts and lines in low that get stuck in your head. Heroes doesn't really play like that. But I think in a way, every kind of aspect that you like, sort of like the poetic nature from low, he puts into the lyrics on Heroes. I think this is one of his better lyrical albums. And because of that, I think it's a really cool emotional experience. And there's just some really great foot tapping great songs beauty and the beast and joe the lion kicking it off great like foot tappers amazing guitar work then you get heroes the title track which is just sublime it is just an emotional crush one of the best pieces you know like we were talking about an hours he does like straightforward kind of songs on hours to me heroes is that kind of song where it's just like straight up singer songwriter style emotional song but the production behind it is just absolutely tremendous it's unreal blackout is awesome i love the second half i love moss garden you know i love sense of doubt i think it's beautiful how it kind of just fades out into that more low like ambient beauty yeah i think this is just one of his just more simply emotional beautiful albums that there is um, anchored obviously by the title track, which is one of my favorite songs of all time, probably. You know, I think maybe if there was just one or two more songs that were a little bit more hook driven or at least got stuck in your head, that were, you know, these songs are a little bit more challenging, which I like. So I don't know what it would take to get it at five stars, but it's not quite there for me. 4.5 Heroes, number 10. So my heart drops at every ranking. Each time you don't say the words low kills me. My number nine is going to be Station to Station. Uh, I kind of feel what Kramser's dealing here. I feel like I should like this more. This is his funk album. Like this is the funkiest I think he ever gets. Uh, Stay, Golden Years, like... He kind of goes from that plastic soul R&B, uh, you know, Luther Vandross doing the backing vocals to this like funkier sort of Berlin-esque, not quite there yet. Uh, I think it's a very good album and I like, I like a lot of elements of it, but there's just like something, I don't know what it is, just like Ramsey, like there's something that doesn't quite stick with me. Golden Years has never been one of my favorite singles, so maybe that's kind of it. I do love the title track. I think 10 minutes, all 10 minutes of it, great. Uh, even love, they throw in some pinch harmonics on that thing. It's fantastic the way it kind of weaves and changes and is basically like its own transformative little epic. Uh, Word on a Wing, I think it's great. TVC 1-5, fantastic. Stay, so funky, that bass line is just disgusting. Um, but I think I miss maybe a little bit of like that Fripp and Blue kind of like just completely out there guitar tones, the Mick Ronson, like when he's paired with like an outrageously kind of interesting and unique guitarist, I, I just get a little bit more from him. Uh, so I think it's a very good album, four stars, but it's not like, upper upper echelon for me it's just it's just very good it's just something missing i don't know what it is something you guys are killing me my number nine i should preface by saying from my last previous ranking a lot of records have moved around some have moved up a little some have moved down a little things have moved around 
but none more than this one. I had this at number 19 before, and it was a record that never, ever really clicked with me until this week. Um, so it is rocketing up my list. I've got Lodger. I'm not exactly sure what was keeping me from fully getting it before, but I always used to kind of feel the way Cram kind of described it, just kind of not quite hitting me. Um, and you would think that, you know, coming after the records that it comes after and being sort of in that style, but more pop oriented that I would really gravitate towards it. I still do think side one is kind of uneven. I don't think I'm, I'm fully in agreement with you guys. African night flight and assassin are pretty weak tracks. So it gets off to a, a rocky start in the first half. Uh, but I think the rest of the record is full of great pop songs. I think the other songs on side one are really good too. Fantastic Voyage is really well put together track, builds and develops really effortlessly. Excellent vocal performance by Bowie. Red Sails, I agree, amazing. Great drumming. Adrian Ballou with some really cool guitar work on it. Love the vocal melody. Look Back in Anger has a killer, really aggressive groove, a kind of like pulsating rhythm section. I, th I think part of the problem used to be the mix. Both uh, Bowie and Visconti had uh, commented on the mixes and saying they regretted going back to New York where they felt the uh, studios probably weren't as well equipped as the ones in the UK and in Europe. It does feel kind of murky and a little dark. And I think that that, that was kind of keeping me from hearing the songs underneath a little. The tracks don't really kind of jump out at you at all. They're, they're kind of buried in the speakers. It feels like a little bit, it's not very vibrant sounding. So I think it requires, you know, more listening and, and, you know, I've, I've had the record for a long time and, you know, pull it out occasionally, listen to it. And it just never hit me until this week. I, I was really digging a lot of the tracks, really all of the tracks, except for the two that I mentioned earlier. I think it's a uh, really good, Effort, great melodies, great guitar playing from Baloo. Um, just a little on the dark side in terms of the uh, sound quality, but very cool record. Be interesting to see if it goes up any more from here. But for now, number nine, four and a half stars. All right. Yeah, I like I said, I just don't know why. Maybe it's the mix. Something about Lodger just doesn't jump out at me. Still like it. My number nine. I think I will get a lot of applause from our commenters for having this the highest among three. We've got Black Star, 4.5 stars. Unlike Heroes, where I couldn't quite pinpoint what keeps it from being five, it is clear what keeps this from being five. And Jason said it as well. It is the song Sue, which does not do it for me at all. Right in the middle of the album, kind of just takes me out of it. Um, and I don't, you know, I'm not a song skipper really, so just gotta get through it. But this album, tremendous, incredibly experimental. The art pop and the jazz and the kind of Radiohead, Kendrick Lamar inspired, like percussion and polyrhythms are all over the place. It's so cool. And I like just this cool, smoky, hazy feel to it, and like ghostly vocals. Love the title track. Album's very pastoral and eccentric. It's kind of tight and clenched and claustrophobic, but the songs are also like lurking and beautifully puzzling. It's like a big trip, really. It's just like this eerie urban feel, like you're wandering around in the dark alleys of New York City while like on acid and it's just like everything's kind of dangerous. Very cool. Has a little bit of like the Berlin trilogy-esqueness to it, which I dig. Um, it's never boring, incredibly captivating. Lazarus is awesome. That post-punk guitar lead and that heavy, haunting, anthemic, like big guitar sounds. Dollar Days is amazing. A little more straightforward and somber, which I kind of like that shift in it. And I think it's just a tremendously cool, saturated, lush album that's just really more interesting every time you listen to it, which is awesome. <laughs> yeah, if it wasn't just for that little just speed bump it's like just in the middle with sue i think this would be a five-star album and uh, just missed among my favorite top five for 2016 but 
you know, I think, I think it's just crazy how good he is at making an album like this or low where it's just an all encompassing, just tapestry of this is an album. And then he can do let's dance or hunky dory and be like, Oh, and these are my songs. Very few artists can do both as well as he does. And yeah, I mean, this is fantastic. Number nine, Black Star, 4.5 stars. And that is the end of my non-five-star album. So I got eight five-stars coming up, baby. Wow. So, yeah, you're a big fan. I'm still at four stars. Still trudging along here. We'll get the five stars eventually, of course, but not quite there. I got The Man Who Sold the World, my number eight. I think this is a great album. I love how unique it sounds. You definitely get that proto like Black Sabbath heavy metal, especially in like the drums and like the cymbal work on something like She Shook Me Cold. Like it's, it's this real like blues heavy rocker, which you just don't get at all in David Bowie's catalog other than on this album. So it's uniqueness, I think, contributes to you know my ranking here. I do like this sound a lot. And I think they do this. I mean, I think this is as good as the first Black Sabbath record. It's not quite that heavy metal kind of sound, but I think the hard rock is all here. There's a little bit of psychedelic, still a little bit of folk on something like The Man Who Sold the World. Um, so it, it's just something that only David Bowie could create. He gets Mick Ronson in here. The guitar is immediately noticeable on almost every track, straight from the width of a circle. It's a fantastic eight minute, just epic. And you know, it's just interesting that he never went back to this sound again. He wasn't doing a sound before. So it's really just this one off that just works on every level. And I think that's a testament to, to Bowie and, and Ronson and the Spiders uh, that they could pull something like this off without like that kind of getting your feet wet, kind of wading into it. It's just like, boom, here's the hard rock. It's magnificent. I don't think there's a, a stinker on the whole album. Maybe just missing like the couple like super sonic. It's, it's tough to compare to, to Hunky Dory and Ziggy Stardust because it doesn't have like those huge singles, but I think it's a, a straight album all the way through. Great, unique uh, piece of work here. So very good four stars. Could that, This is one that could inch up to four and a half. I think I have some some more listening to do on this one. All right. Number eight for me is Let's Dance. He left RCA. He signed with EMI and he wanted a fresh start. So he hires Niall Rogers of Chic. He enlists Stevie Ray Vaughan. He makes a straight up pop record. It's a unique pop record, though, because it has some of uh, Niall Rogers' R&B flavor. It's got some bluesy flavor from stevie ray vaughn for some people kind of i guess joe from the sound of it this record comes down to the big three singles which were all monster hits but i think the other tracks are just as good if not better some of them um without you has a really cool feel and some cool playing from stevie ray vaughn ricochet might be my favorite track on the record just incredible rhythm section great groove the rhythm guitar on it is fantastic. And then that breakdown where they say it's not the end of the world and the groove comes back in, man, it is killer. I love it. Crazy good drumming on Criminal World. That track also has a really great guitar solo from Stevie Ray Vaughan. Great, great players on this record. You've got Omar Hakim and Tony Thompson splitting drumming duties. They're both on fire. Carmine Rojas just killing it on bass. And I, I know a lot of people look at this record as, oh, he's just doing simple pop songs on this record and that's it. But the musicianship on this record is out of control. It is so good. A lot of these people are the same people that play on um, Daft Punk's uh, Random Access Memories. I'm pretty sure Omar Hakim, Tony Thompson, and Carmine Rojas are all on that record. So top top notch players who have played on a ton of records and it is just cooking love it uh, and tons of great pop melodies too bowie's you know doing his thing on top of it also really cool record yes i think joe not having that in the top 10 
is the biggest surprise he's given me as well. Um, but that's why we do this. My number eight, I think there's about 10% of the community that is going to gush over my pick here. And then the other 90% will be like, what the hell, man? I've got five stars at number eight for Outside. I love this album. And Joe, my man, you're almost there. I think you can get there, especially if you do what I did. You really got to dive into it, read the plot line, all of that stuff, like the different characters. It's got like a cool, like mystery noir graphic novel kind of feel to it. You know, if it scored the movie Sin City, you'd probably be like, it's the best thing I've ever heard. But I think it's tremendously cool. I love the song Outside. The album's very dark. It's got this cool, disturbing underbelly. This industrial Trent Reznor inspired sound fused with like this like cornucopia of jazz and just chaos. It's so cool. It's got this whole stormy sensation. The hero's filthy lesson is awesome, but there's like this primal animalistic kind of vibes on it as well. Small plot of land like Joe talked about has some unbelievable playing on it with just kind of the free roaming jazz piano and my favorite you know part of like free prose jazz is always a, the drumming which is sensational here i adore the atmosphere i think it's hauntingly beautiful and lush stormy quality to it i have not been to oxford town is awesome there's a cool cover of it in the movie starship troopers but this version is a little better dark sinister dangerous like almost like peter gabriel security feel all over it and there's just like on top of all that all because of that cool kind of story and him getting into the characters and playing these different characters and telling the story, there's like these feverish emotions that bleed into the album tremendously. Terrific use of just every instrument and studio technique to give it a real cinematic quality. I think it's kind of like the low of the 90s for him. And every time you listen to it, it gets a little better and better. And then if you kind of do some research and follow along the story and the concept. It's really rich experience, which is really cool. You know, I, I liked it when I first listened to it, like in college and just the more I listened to it, which I probably went 15 years without listening to it. It just gets better every time. Story is cool. It's like the cyber Gothic murder mystery story. Apparently it was inspired by Twin Peaks, which is really cool. And I think just the tone and everything of it is unlike, almost anything else I've ever heard. So I think it's really cool and impressive. You know, um, I didn't expect Jason to have this anywhere in the top 10 or 15, but Dead Last is crazy to me. You are too obsessed with hooks and radio history and you're getting more and more away from this stuff and it pains me. Sure. I, I mean, I, I see both your sides. I'm, I'm in the middle a little bit. Um, although I don't think you should have to read a, a graphic novel to catch up on the, the story of an album. But my number seven is going to be Heroes. I think you're both a little harsh on this bad boy. Uh, although you probably have the same rating as, as I do. It would be five stars if you know a couple of these tracks were just sh sh shot into oblivion. Um, but I mean, the first half, is so good it's choice is what it is beauty and the beast amazing track that can't say no to the beauty and the beast and he goes darling it's just perfect uh it's, it's more fun it's so much more fun than low it's uh more upbeat than low it sounds like they're having more fun on this album in general uh joe the lion has just a ridiculous ridiculous guitar lead from robert fripp uh just oof. And he's, his presence here definitely increases my love of this album because I think his work is just as good as it gets as far as guitarists goes, uh, even more so than, you know, King Crimson, really. I love when he's uh, collaborating with someone like Bowie, like Peter Gabriel, he would do as well, where you have like a great pop songwriter and he's bringing all this like dissonance and like weird noise, but it, it just always works because the melodies and the, everything are so strong. And this is a perfect example. Uh, Joe the Lion in particular. Heroes, obviously, amazing pop song. Great, great 
great vocal performance from Bowie. Uh, one of his best, the, the passion, the screams, so much dynamics. Um, I like it, you know, five times more than anything on, on low. Blackout, I think, is like enough of that avant-garde um, to satisfy like the below people, uh, the kraut rock stuff. But the guitar work, again, just kind of lifts it into this upper stratosphere for me. Um, and then you get to V2 Schneider's okay. Sense of Doubt, Moss Garden, New Coon are just, I wish they could just swap places with the low uh, ambient stuff because I think Jason's right. Like the low stuff has those little hooks, like those interesting parts. This is like pure atmosphere which just brings the whole album to a screeching halt, uh, kind of kills me because I really want to, you know, love this album, five star it, but can't quite do it with this three in there. It does come back though with Secret Life of Arabia, which is real funky. It's, it's such a great album, but those, those three songs, you know, that's 13 minutes of a 40 minute album. Tough to overcome that, um, but still a great album. Wouldn't be disappointed if he added a five stars, top two, top three, but I can only put it at number seven. Well, there are certainly arguments to be made about Heroes being as good or better than Low, but saying that Heroes is a more fun album is not one of them. It is way darker, denser, colder, dreary. Low has got some groove and funk on it, and Heroes is just cold. My number seven is low, maybe the hardest one to place. I love it. I think it's great. But how do you even compare it to any of his other albums when half of it's instrumental, except Heroes? They, they really are tough to compare to the other records. Actually, this record opens with an instrumental, too, in Speed of Life. It also closes side one with another instrumental before you go to the all instrumental side too. Speed of Life, though, I think is a great instrumental track. I love the bridge section with that really melodic guitar line. I think it's so cool. I, I, and like I was just saying to Joe, I, I think this and Heroes, even though they have those structural similarities, I think they're very different records. Low to me is way more sparse, angular, and rhythmic. Heroes kind of just comes at you as like one block of sound. I don't know if that makes any sense, but that's kind of how I hear it. I think they, you know, pretty undeniably were both really groundbreaking at the time. Sound and Vision, super addictive. Love its catchiness. The guitar on that track is incredible. But then you get the somewhat more ambient side too. And I don't know, it's, it's tough. It's not that I hate the ambient music or, or I don't like it even. But to put it on the back half of a record that is so different on the other side, I don't think the juxtaposition makes a lot of sense on these two records. So I do feel like they hold the record back. I don't know. It's really tough and I struggle with it and I want to put it higher, but I also want to put it lower. So I don't know. I like, I truly love the entirety of side one and I think him doing what he's doing on side two is cool, but to, to grade it and to decide how it plays as a full listening experience in those two halves is really difficult for me. I, I don't know. Number seven, four and a half stars low. My number seven is let's dance straight up pop, but not ordinary pop like Jason said, and that's what makes it a great pop record instead of just another pop record. One of the best first three song lineups like ever. I mean, all those songs are huge. You still hear them this day. I also love just kind of the fun sex appeal. He's kind of interjecting in all of these songs. Like he's so seductive on China Girl and Let's Dance when he does, a, you know, the serious Moonlight line and all that. I would be foolish to say the other songs are better than the big three, but they are very, 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 very good. Love Cat People, Without You is Awesome. 
Ricochet, this really cool big wide open like art piece. I, I don't really have anything to say that Jason already hasn't. Criminal World is awesome. The bass on it is fantastic. I just love the attitude of just being like, I'm going all in, just writing some of the catchiest pop tunes you've ever heard. And one thing we haven't really talked about yet, Joe did a little bit talking about heroes and he was dead on. We haven't really talked about Bowie as a singer. And uh, not just his albums and his vision is a chameleon from era to era, but his voice changes so much. Like he does that really like nasally weird, odd thing the early 70s glammy ones here. This one is more power and crystal clear and seductive, but like some of the power he's putting into like modern love just sounds so good. The way he sings, you know, on Cat People when he does the gasoline line, it's just it's awesome. Like he's really just grabbing the mic and just commanding so much presence. It's fantastic. Yeah, just nothing bloated about this album i think it is like perfectly condensed and tight and trimmed it's fantastic number seven let's dance five stars okay well moving on we're, we're getting close to the top here still got a, a couple more four stars for you this one i think is wildly underrated as far as an album goes i got diamond dogs at number six you know, it doesn't have the, the spiders, so there's no Mick Ronson. So David's like, hey, I'm going to play guitar on this. And against all odds, I think it works really well uh, because he has kind of like this garage, like a little grungy, like a little garagey, little punk style to his guitar. Um, something like Rebel Rebel. Like it, it, it almost feels like it's gonna fall apart in his hands, um, but it's such a unique and excellent guitar line. It almost sounds like he's not 100% like sure of where he's going and playing. Like it's, it's like listening to like a, a guitarist that isn't on the same level. Like you can kind of tell he's not, he's no Mick Ronson, he's no Fripp, he's no, you know, Stevie Ray Vaughan, but I think it just works really well on this whole album because it is kind of imperfect sounding a little bit, a little messier and dirtier. Um, it's moving away from the glam. It's still like, you know, dabbling in it, but uh, kind of the exaggerated rock opera. You got the 58 second lead off track, Future Legend. It goes right into Diamond Dogs, which I think is a great track. Uh, Sweet Thing Candidate, Sweet Thing, extremely underrated. Uh, you get Rebel Rebel, which is, you know, just a great single. Um, so it, it has everything you want in a Bowie album. It's unique uh, because he's playing guitar. There's more like saxophone on it, which is cool. Um, and it's just, you know, kind of like The Man Who Sold the World. Just it doesn't sound quite like anything else. Um, 1984, like a very theatrical sounding, which I dig a lot. The extra brass, the cool piano parts, and that kind of grungy, dirty guitar style from Bowie, I think make it a really cool, unique record. And uh, yeah, just everything I want in a, in a Bowie album. Great single, unique sound, you know, David Bowie, extra vampy and theatrical. So love it. Four stars. All right. My number six, four and a half stars, Hunky Dory. The record that I predict Joe will have number one. They add Trevor Boulder on bass. You also get a ton of Rick Wakeman on this record, tons of piano. It dials back the hard rock of The Man Who Sold the World. This record's a little bit more pop leaning again, hearkening back at times to his earlier folkier songs. This is the first time he's really showing some glimpses of the glamier side to come. The record at the time of release wasn't very well promoted and failed to chart until Ziggy kind of broke through the following year. And then this record kind of entered the charts and did pretty well. Uh, Changes, Oh You Pretty Things, Life on Mars, Queen Bitch, all classics. But I think the deeper cuts here are also very good. Kooks, Quicksand, Andy Warhol, all equally great. The general consensus here is that this is the record where Bowie kind of finds his voice, which I think is fairly true. I think you can also kind of say the same thing for Mick Ronson. 
on here. You know, Mick Ronson absolutely tears it up on Man Who Sold the World. His playing on that record is phenomenal. But I think his tone and his style and his way of choosing notes changes a little bit on this record. Uh, I think you can really hear it on Song for Bob Dylan. Um, it, it kind of like where his style just all of a sudden snaps into place where on the previous record, he's kind of just doing, you know, what a lot of blues rock guitar players were doing at the time. I, but his playing on this record is really great and is equally great going forward on subsequent records. I think the sound of everything just kind of comes together on this record in a, a pretty special way. The piano playing from Wakeman too is a huge element on this record and it's fantastic. Just a lot of really great songs. Four and a half stars, Hunky Dory. Didn't know I was the biggest Bowie fan of, of us. I'm, you you knew I was? Oh, good. Because I've been talking about 19 five, albums at four stars are up. I got I've been talking about five star albums for a half hour here, buddy. Um, Scary Monsters is my number six. This is where it's really tough. This could be number one on any given day. Almost pretty much. Well, maybe we'll see. But yeah, this album's pretty freaking great, man. It's got this hip, new, new wave inspired kind of injection, soaked with like kind of glamour and fun, really lavish guitar painted all throughout. It's like some of just my favorite kind of guitar style is just life's an esque, as we often say, just coming in and painting a little bit, getting out, backing off, coming back in, paint a little bit, back off. Very cool. You know, really vivid has this hot neon kind of flair to it up the hill backwards is awesome i love that acoustic part almost has like a magic bus feel by the who beginning then goes into like this really cool like old school sing-along folk jam but with this 80s flair it's a really cool combination bass on the album is probably i don't know i mean almost every instrument's the best on station to station but the bass on this album is anchoring almost every track especially like ashes to ashes so cool title track is awesome kind of signals where the decade will go for, for other artists like it's so cool that he's a, sometimes a really great chameleon sometimes he's a trendsetter sometimes he manages to do them both at the same time which sounds like an oxymoron but if anyone's gonna break that it'll be bowie i used to have a problem with the sequencing of this album now it doesn't really bother me at all Kind of like the flow of it. The heart of this album is the middle of it, um, which is really stacked with fashion, teenage wildlife, scream like a baby is awesome. Uh, love because you're lo young is really cool, kind of heavy. Reminds me a little bit of a Gonna Raise Hell by Cheap Trick. Very cool song. Um, yeah, I think this song, uh, you know, sometimes, sometimes when I listen to music, I kind of get these images of like, colors and stuff and this one has like a really cool like neon kind of purple vibe to it um i swear i'm not like into astrology or anything that was one of the weirdest things i've ever said on the channel but i do get like these just vivid like sensations of just like these this cool neon 80s kind of style to it it's very cool very lavish all the songs are great i mean i think the production and the style on this album is the most admirable thing about it but the songs are really good too Ashes to Ash is probably my favorite on it, but you know, it's um it's pretty cool that he wanted to do, you know, obviously Let's Dance is a straight up pop record. This one has a more like poppier element to it. Um, you know, it's definitely not a blues rock album or anything like that. It's not an avant-garde experimental synth driven album like Low. It's its own thing and it's friggin' great. I like how it kind of bookends with the It's No Game, part one and two. Great album, number six, five stars, Scary Monsters. All right, on top five now, Big Guns, Big Guns all, all through here for me. Uh, my number five is going to be Young Americans, Plastic Soul, Bowie, 1975. Clear transition between Diamond Dogs, this, and Station to Station. He's kind of jumping across genres again. I mean, I guess he does pretty much in every track until he hits the Berlin period. But, you know, for whatever reason, he wanted to do a soul R&B album and he <laughs> nails it. He's good at, you know, this genre hopping. Uh, he gets all lover boy with the vocals. You got Luther Vandross backing him up. 
uh, the Cherry, Robin Clark. So you got the like the full R and B chorus behind them. The songs are great. Young Americans, obviously classic. You got Win, which he you know really the first taste. You know, Young Americans still kind of David Bowie from before. You kind of still hear the sound uh, that he was doing on you know, Rebel Rebel, something like that. But then you know once Win kicks in, it's like okay, we're in a whole new ball game here. Uh, just so smooth and uh, you know fascination which is co-written by Luther Vandross just has a totally different element to it like it's just totally unique in his catalog uh, something like right somebody out there loves uh, likes me he's just his vocal power and range like he really like I think Jason mentioned before just all over the place dipping low like going up high doing like this real kind of soulful white boy kind of R&B style and I I think he just kills it like you know this is a real testament to his vocal range uh, his ability to just be a chameleon and take in a, a completely different sound than what he had been playing with before and just absolutely nail it um, it's, I love the way it's um, bookended with Young Americans and Fame the two big singles I think both are fantastic uh, fame so unique funky uh john lennon with the backing vocals real sparse sounding like it it's not just like that plastic soul across the universe the beatles cover not quite that same you know r&b philly soul sound every track on here i love i love the philly soul the crooning uh from bowie tell a unique fun super fun album uh, and uh, yeah, just another one that Billy, just another style, just adds it to his, you know, quiver back here. It's like a glam, folk, hard rock, fun, R&B. Nails it. All right. My number five is my prediction for Cram's winner. I've got a lot insane. The first uh, Bowie album that was written after he had become a huge superstar. It kind of feels that way. You get both sides of it. You get like this really glitzy, glamorous type of look at it with a, a track like Watch That Man. Then you follow it up with the title track, which gives you that really dark and isolated feel, kind of like the negative side of all of the attention he's been getting. Bowie has described the record as Ziggy Goes to Washington or Ziggy Under the Influence of America. I think the Americana thing kind of comes through on a track like Drive-In Saturday, which has this kind of like 50s drive-in diner doo-wop influence. The same way that uh, Rick Wakeman's piano playing is instrumental on Hunky Dory. I think Mike Garson's here is really doing a lot. I think he really changes the mood of the record uh, it kind of places this cloud of darkness over the shiny glam rock that the rock band portion is, is providing, which is very cool. I think the songs are mostly all excellence. I think it is a little front loaded. I think the front half is stronger than the back half. And again, I think this is one of those records. It's very highly thought of generally in his catalog, but it's one of the records where he's like not reinventing the wheel or anything. I, th I think it feels a little like Ziggy part two which holds it back a tiny bit um, from being like upper, upper, upper echelon, but still an excellent record. Classic Bowie, four and a half stars. Number five. What does it take to get a five? What does it take to get a five from this man? Well, there's really no right or wrong answers from here on out. My number five is... Ziggy Stardust and the Spiders from Myers. <laughs> Love the story. What? And Joe's got no gladiator. Those, those big old thumbs down for me. Sorry. Didn't want to break your flow there. No, it's okay. Um, great story. Great concept. Love the themes of sexuality and rock and roll commentary. And it's all just so grand, so colorful. Paints such a cool picture. Bigger sound than Hunky Dory, more guitar, more glam, more arena, like proto-punk kind of style. I also think this is the first album where his voice really goes from great to, man, this guy's a hell of a singer. I think there's so many 
underrated songs on here like the opener five years love the rhythm on soul love moon age daydream has an awesome rock and roll solo a swagger and the solo is fantastic love the strolling beat on starman which has just tremendous melody on it lady stardust is awesome lots of great longing in his voice there Suffragette City is amazing. The melody in the chorus with the, uh, you know, don't lean on me, man, because you can't afford the ticket is just so catchy. I love it. The hop on this album is awesome. This is a fun album. Heroes is not fun. Um, that was your, <laughs> I thought I was your weirdest comment, I think, of this whole video. Um, but this is just great rock and roll with style and with character. I mean, it's, it's not art rock, but it's rock and roll done very artistically, which is pretty cool. It's what sets him apart from all of these, you know, hard rock acts of its time that are driven by riff and, you know, and thunderous drums and everything. And which is great, too. I mean, obviously, we love Zeppelin and The Who and all them. But this one has just such a unique voice and flavor. This era of Bowie, just fantastic. All the songs are great. The stories, the imagery. The vivid imagination five stars ziggy you know could could shuffle you know realistically around pretty easily like i said there's no right or wrong answers for me here so awesome awesome stuff listen i had a lot more fun listening to heroes than i did low or station to station all right so sorry sheesh uh you asked for five stars crams i'm gonna give it to you with my number four Aladdin Sane. Uh, yes, Ziggy under the influence of America, but I don't think Bowie strays too far from the star there. Uh, same backing band with the addition of the excellent Mike Garson, uh, his jazzy kind of, you know, avant-garde piano uh, really adds like a new layer, new texture, especially on the title track. Uh, kind of unexpected too because it doesn't start out you know like it's going to go that way and then he drops in these ridiculous piano parts complete change up from like rick wakeman's work on hunky dory uh, but I, I think it works really well really adds uh, some extra colors to this one uh time more great piano uh but mick ronson's also there with his great guitar work i think the album's definitely like still in the glam milieu but uh, you definitely get that American you know, music influence uh, that I think goes beyond just the jazz, like you got the doo-wop and maybe a little more like R&B, soul, and, and definitely a Rolling Stones influence. Uh, watch that man really close to the Stones, which is great, you know, big rollicking fun piece. Um, and I think the only thing that holds it back, maybe from even higher on my list, is the cover of Let's Spend the Night Together. Like just not his best cover, I don't think. I, I like, um, you know, Across the Universe more. And it just, his phrasing kind of throws me off a little bit. It, it's tough because that's such a good song from the Stones. I just don't think his quite measures up and kind of breaks the feel of the album for me a little bit, just a little bit. Still five stars. Uh, but not quite. I think that alone really is everything else is just phenomenal. So good. So, so hard to place these it sucks. All right. My number four is Diamond Dogs. Self-produced, kind of a transitional record. It's his first one without the spiders, but it's still a little bit on the glam rocky kind of sound. But he's also giving you tiny little glimpse of his interest in soul and R&B as well. It's a combination of multiple projects kind of not really working out for him. He was working on a, a Ziggy musical. He was also working on an adaptation of 1984 that was ultimately denied. He didn't get the rights to it, so he couldn't do it. So there's kind of remnants of both of those projects here. This is another record for a long time that I didn't really fully get into, like Lodger. Until I heard John Vanderslice do a cover of the entire record. And his versions are extremely different. But I think hearing his version, I don't know, just kind of like unlocked something. Like I was able to pick out the beauty in some of the melodies and things. I think the same way that 
the mix is kind of murky on Lodger and kind of maybe held me back from getting it for a long time. There's a lot of really weird production choices on this record. There's all kinds of things that are run through filters and flangers and phasers. It's like, why would you do that? And I think now I think a lot of that is really cool, but I think it kind of held like can hold you back from uh, he hearing some of the record's inherent beauty. It kind of like disguises it and kind of obscures some of the melodies. Uh, but now I think it works. It's great. The title track is awesome. His vocals on Sweet Thing are great. Gorgeous melody on that track. Rock and Roll With Me, I think is really cool too. Really soaring ballad. Never really hear anyone mention that track, but I think it's a really good deep cut. We Are The Dead is also really cool. I love the electric piano on it. 1984 is a, a, a totally different than the rest of the record. It's got that like scratching wah and disco strings on it, which is cool. It's a weird album. It's an intersection of styles and sounds, but I, th I think the songs are really good. I think the melodies are great. The bizarre production choices, once you kind of get used to them, kind of endear you to the record. I think it's really cool. Four and a half still for Diamond Dogs. Okay. Mm. Number four, Young Americans, five stars. Love this transition into pop, but his version of pop with the style and the soul with the Philly sound, the plastic soul done so well. Joe's right, he nails every second of this. The backup singing is phenomenal. Win and Fascination are greatly underappreciated. Playing on Fascination is just excellent. Saxophone on this album is great. I'm with Joe. I think it's really cool putting fame at last, um, just ending you on this really groovy like dance, like just leaving you with really cool flavor and feeling. Getting a little bit of disco vibes here before that kind of took off. So he's setting a little bit of trend here. I just love the style of this album. It's so kind of extravagant and sexy and insincere and plastic like everything like the lush studio 54 like 70s coked out kind of vibe is where everyone's acting all you know everyone thinks that this is the realest thing going on but it's all fake and all facade he, he nails it all about lush indulgence bit sultry bit petty perfectly mid 70s it's like a very sparkly shallow album all about glitz so cool very melodramatic glowing lights and dance floors songs are all just so hot to touch sax again just firing on all cylinders all the songs are great can you hear me fame like the title track is one of the best songs of all time love the cover of across the universe what more could you want it's so cool so unique i don't know why this doesn't get more love from people but i'm glad i got joe to back me up Five stars, number four, Young Americans. All right, my number three. This one definitely is the biggest riser of the group. I think I always appreciated this one, but not quite as much as I should have. My number three, Scary Monsters and Super Creeps from 1980. Just a phenomenal, amazing album. Some of the best guitar work from Robert Fripp you'll ever have. You'll ever hear. Just incredible. Bowie, I think this one really sums up everything he's done so far. Like it's a little bit glammy still. It's very, you know, there's some 80s pop in there. There's still a little bit of that Berlin. Uh, there's some new wave. It's just like a, a perfect summation. He's bringing back Major Tom for Ashes to Ashes. He reworks the hero's uh, melody. For teenage wildlife so you know he's he's just kind of like bringing it all together here this is his you know triumphant in my opinion last you know great 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 album it's it's also really weird you know right off the bat you get the japanese like talking on it's no game and then maybe his most unhinged vocal performance he's just screaming and uh just doing all sorts of crazy vampy stuff and all the while you know the band just killing it Roy Bitten on piano on a bunch of tracks Robert Fripp Pete Townsend drops in for some guitar work um so it, it's kind of like an all-star cast 
and the songs are just so catchy up the hill backwards scary monsters got kind of that like evil groove to it ash to ashes you get the major tom a uh, bunch of really good vocal hooks on that fashion is like so forward thinking like that's something you'd hear from like madonna like six seven years down the line uh teenage wildlife i think is great kind of reworking of that classic melody but with extra guitar heroics uh and kind of a more epic maybe not more epic vocal performance but kind of a different epic vocal performance um and there's just so much cool stuff because you're young has like, like an abba like disco bass line um kingdom come seem like a baby there's not a single like moment I, I don't think of weakness on this entire track it might be his most consistently excellent album straight through even more so i think than hunky dory or ziggy in a lot of cases it may not have like those extreme heights but every song on here is fantastic it's a winner and just a really amazing it's got to be underappreciated at this point because you don't really hear about it that much kind of gets lost in the shuffle in the 80s uh was a great year but uh, I think this is probably his, his most underrated album at this point. So five stars, easy five stars for Scary Monsters and Super Creeps. That is also my number three. I've got it at five stars. It was my runner-up album in 1980 to Peter Gabriel Melt. I love it. I think it's awesome. I basically see this as a more commercial version of the Berlin Trilogy all the experimentation that he was doing distilled into great pop songs, retaining all of his artistic integrity. Lodger was kind of already doing a similar thing, but the sound and the production on this record is so much better, really crystal clear, sounds great. A little bit of new wave, a little bit of post-punk. You get Robert Fripp instead of Adrian Ballou. His work on this record is incredible. Some of my favorite playing of his that he's ever done in his career. I think it's awesome. It's No Game, Teenage Wildlife, Up That Hill Backwards, Fashion, the title track, just phew, amazing guitar work on all of those songs. Like Joe said, you got a couple other guest appearances, Roy Bitten, Pete Townsend. I think there are dark themes on this record, but it's at the same time still inviting and super listenable. It's a rare record, I think, that goes down so smoothly while also being fairly challenging and, you know, a really interesting piece of art at the same time, really comparable to some of the stuff Peter Gabriel was doing at the time, uh, just super easily digestible and also challenging, just great, great pop music, some of the best ever, five stars, scary monsters, and super creeps. So Joe has Ziggy and Hunky Dory left. Jason's got Station to Station and Ziggy left. My number three, obviously I'm, I'm not gonna say stars. Everything's five stars from here on. I got Hunky Dory from the loaded year 71. Every time I open my mouth, Joe's like low, low. Please don't let this motherfucker have low number one, please, for God's sakes. Hunky Dory is a really cool work of art. It's got that great warm 70s sound. Piano's fantastic. Wakeman, on, unreal on this. Jazz and rock elements, pretty cool. Very art house, very flavorful, full of character. It's all about the ideas and always finding unique ways to musically flush them out. He's always, to me, a musician second in a mind first, if that makes sense. Like, I think Bowie, with just the way he operates his mind and the way he expresses himself, could have been a painter if he wanted to, could have been a sculptor, could have been a filmmaker, like whatever craft chose music and it comes out so cool. And that, that's why his music is so good. Just, just so much personality and expression on everything, especially on this album. Really good cocktail of different genre ingredients here. Go with like just such a good palette with familiarity, yet also this could only be Bowie. Changes, great opener. All the songs are great to masterclass. Life on Mars is unreal. You know, everything's quirky, but the melodies are so good as well. Um, there's a sense of like existentialism, like 
looking down, but also like manages to write these really like heartwarming sounding commonplace tales at the same time. I think I think it was the Neil Young video where I talk about him being able to write from the inside and the outside, but Bowie's songs are like both at the same time. It's so interesting. Songs are odd and predictable, but totally satisfying. Kooks is such a cool little tune. Great lyrics. Jason's right. The the lesser known tracks that don't get the radio play are just as good, like Quicksand and Andy Warhol and stuff. The acoustic click on Andy Warhol is so cool. Always wish Wakeman's piano was a little louder on that track, though, because I think he's crushing it underneath. Queen Bitch just absolutely rules. Nice little jolt at the end. Love Bellway Brothers. So cool. Such a cool mood. Songs rock. They're memorable. There's nothing more you could want. Hunky Dory, number three, five stars. All right. Uh, big questions remain for all of us. Which is it going to be? Well, my number two is going to be Hunky Dory. Hunky uh, from 71 made my top five in one of the great years ever. And they're, they're pretty close. Um, just the, the pivot from like the hard rock, Black Sabbath esque of the man who sold to the world to this like lush folk pop. Just amazing that Bowie can just keep doing these reinventions like it ain't no thing um you know it's not quite glammy but it's not quite folk it's it's kind of living in this own like space between all these genres which I think is cool I think it adds to its uniqueness and its greatness um Rick Wakeman's piano probably like the secret weapon here because it is just so extravagant on changes, uh, life on Mars. Like there's these like three minute, those you know little pop songs. But if you take a close look at the, what Wakeman is playing on these parts, like it's completely like ridiculously complex and awesome, and it just adds like this extra uh, layer to some of these songs. I think the songwriting itself is far beyond what Billy had done before changes um the the weird chord changes on oh you pretty things uh, just going from like completely different keys to shifting around and then like it drops into this incredibly catchy chorus where you know the spiders are doing these great backup vocals it sounds like a completely different song uh love the way it, it shifts and twists and turns uh life on mars one of the great pop songs of all time I think the, the minor tracks are great. Kooks, Quicksand, Fill Your Heart. Andy Warhol has, you know, it, it goes beyond just pop music. There's all these interesting kind of arty elements. Uh, same with like the Buley Brothers. Song for Bob Dylan, amazing. One of my favorite things associated with Bob Dylan. If it was by Dylan, it would probably be my third favorite Bob Dylan song. Um, but it's just, it kind of brings it all together. <laughs> Uh, the Mick Ronson guitar, the, the vocals from Bowie, the, and the better songwriting, the, the great piano from Rick Wakeman. And it's just pretty much a perfect pop album. Yeah, it's my number number two. It's obviously five stars. And you don't get to be top five in 1971 unless you're five stars. You don't really get to be top 20 in 71 unless you're five stars. All right, cool. That's an interesting twist. So in my first Bowie video, I said that Station to Station was closing the gap closer and closer. To, and, you know, I expected that someday it would overtake Ziggy Stardust. But this week, Ziggy Stardust widened that gap a lot. And Station to Station is my number two. So is this record, five stars, absolutely love it. Made at the height of Bowie's drug problems, he remembers little to nothing about making it, but it established the excellent rhythm section of Carlos Alomar, Murray, and Davis. You also get Earl Slick and Roy Bitten. He takes the, the Philly soul sound of young Americans and morphs it into something a little darker and weirder, a little more unique, brings in a little, you know, touches of funk. His diet at the time, like Cram said, was bell peppers, milk, and cocaine. 
The footage of him around this time, he looks like a skeleton with bright red hair. It's an awesome look for a rock star. Absolutely love it. Definitely not good for his health. He said he was hallucinating 24 hours a day. Somehow this record comes out absolutely brilliant. It's a total miracle. The musical ideas just keep coming on this record. They seem endless. They sound really fresh. The band is great. Alomar called it one of the most glorious albums he's ever had the chance to work on uh, due to the amount of experimenting that they were doing in the studio. And I feel like the record is kind of cold and detached, and maybe that's what you guys aren't quite connecting with. But I think it's also really all like at the same time warm the production's really warm sounding there's great grooves i think the melodies through the entire record are beautiful maybe the most consistently melodic record he's ever made i just think the the hooks on this are great um only six tracks but i think every one of them is perfect there's not a second of this record i would change my favorite album of 1976 and my second favorite david bowie record station to station well not going to be a trifecta but two of you guys lining up which just for the odds of two of us having the same number one is pretty bizarre all right joe it's time to me time for me to talk about my number two which will reveal my number one my number two favorite david bowie album is low Rejoice, my friend. Five stars. Gets better every time I listen. New sound right off the bat. Brian Eno coming in, and the future is now. It's amazing. It's got all the synth, the icy landscapes on it, the electronic, the robotic nature of it. But at the heart of it are some of the catchiest parts Bowie's ever come up with. Sound and vision it's stuck in your head like it's just fantastic breaking glass rules there's some like serious rock and roll swagger on here this even though sounds so cold and icy is a very pretty album it's got that cool post-punk you know sonic imagery and abstract sensations i think it's just so cool and new and beautiful it's got a touch of like a new wavy kind of psychedelia and paranoia through this like kaleidoscopes of sounds coming at you and this totally immersive experience. It's just like the future coming right at you. something like new career in a new town sounds 30 years ahead of its time and is so simple and just gets that just little part just gets stuck in your head. It's really simply done. Just like let's do the bass, let's do the drums and this twinkly little synth part. So cool. Be my wife. Love those big piano hits. Great heavier tune for the album. Warzawa, 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 Warzawa is great. Um, it's awesome and haunting. This album is like the sounds on this album just kind of like bleed the way ink does on the paper into this lush, beautiful soundscape. Pioneering. If you listen to like, or if you watch drama films from like the late 90s to mid 2000s, they all like kind of have these synth scores, not all of them, but a lot of them have these synth scores that are like directly just side two of low inspired. And like, you know, this album predates Kid A with like some of that stuff, like with those textures and everything. I don't have a problem with the side one, side two kind of halving because everything's just so good and so new for its time that it doesn't really matter what the sequencing is it's just it's such a cool experience it is my second favorite album by david bowie five stars and joe it was not gonna overtake my number one so thank the lord above thank ziggy for that one um yeah i mean was fine was was cool I think the fact that it influenced like Joy Division and Kid A is the biggest knock against it, in my opinion. Um, and they, they took their original band name from Warsaw was I love them. It was Warsaw. Anywho, enough low talk. Done with that forever. Never have to hear about it again. Number one, I'm with Jason. This 
gap has only widened uh, during this week of listening. I just think this record, the rise and fall of Ziggy Stardust and the Spiders from Mars, is basically perfect. It didn't win for me in 72, only because of Talking Book by Stevie Wonder, uh, which I regard as a perfect album. This one, pretty much perfect. I can't really say I would change anything about it. Kind of borrows the same um, composition as Hunky Dory. You have like these smaller, lesser tracks that almost stand up to the big singles. Uh, you know, Moon Age Daydream, Starman, Ziggy Stardust, Suffragette City. And these are just some of the best songs ever written, some of the best rock songs, probably the best glam rock songs of all time. Mick Ronson's guitar, unbelievable on Moon Age Daydream. One of my favorite you know, outros ever when him and the symphony are just like shredding together. It sounds like, you know, a supernova or something. And I love, you know, the theme, the spaciness of it all. I uh, didn't wear this NASA shirt for nothing. Um, just kind of elevates it to a whole nother level. It, it just feels like it's just not of this earth. Uh, and I think maybe this album, more than any other album in history, kind of has that feel. Like no one has ever captured like an idea of an alien from another planet, like coming down and saving the world with rock and roll. Like I think only David Bowie could pull that off as ridiculous as the story kind of is. He really grounds it and makes it like real. Um, and the music just, you know, completely drives the whole thing. Every song has great hooks, great choruses. They're hard, you know, they're kind of brutal in some places. Uh, the screaming at the end of five years. Um, but, you know, there's some really pretty stuff on here as well. And I think it's just sort of the, the perfect encapsulation of David Bowie him being someone else, being, you know, a spaceman. Um, and I, you know, I just think it works best. He works best as this astral figure, this God, Messiah, um, that this album is just everything I want in, in David Bowie and sort of a glam rock, early rock and roll album. It's just, it, I don't know, it seems so like, far from like the blues rock or even you know of Zeppelin or or anybody like that like it's a whole different galaxy of rock and roll and I think that's what makes it so unique and special and why it's my number one the rise and fall of Ziggy Stardust and the Spiders from Mars has been my favorite David Bowie album forever I've heard it a million times and I maybe have never liked it more than I liked it this week. I was enjoying the hell out of it. I can confidently say that this is has cemented itself in my top 10 favorite albums of all time. I think it is 11 absolutely perfect rock and roll songs. Five Years and Rock and Roll Suicide, I think, are two of David Bowie's best pieces of writing. I think Moon Age Daydream, Ziggy Stardust, and Suffragette City are the band hitting its peak and gelling together as players. The production is incredible. It's fairly simple. It's really raw. It sounds like a rock band. The drum sounds and the bass sounds are unbelievable. Uh, but I think there's also just the right amount of embellishments. You get strings and horns and Bowie playing saxophone. The whole concept of Ziggy even if the story doesn't really make total sense, it, it's exactly what I want my rock and roll to be. It's theatrical, it's over the top, it's larger than life, but at the same time, it's real, it's grounded. It's the sound of four guys just bashing out some tunes together. I think it nails both sides of the equation of just being like a kick-ass rock band and being like this like space age story, this wild concept, uh, very theatrical. I think every second of the record is completely transcendent and it's just a, an absolutely perfect record. Five stars. If I could give it 10 stars, I would. All right. My winner is kind of basically Ziggy 2. I've got Aladdin Saint. Five stars. You know, just glam rocking all over the place, but with a lot of just weird, odd, just like 
statements and choices here that I just adore. To me, it's sort of like you guys were describing it as like Ziggy does America. I, I, I see it as like Ziggy's now on earth and he's trying to go through like everyday life, but it's like a duck out of water kind of s scenario where he's trying to go like do his thing, but he's still Ziggy Stardust. It's really bizarre. And it's just got this cool, like it's less idealistic album than Ziggy, but it's got this cool kind of fun, comical nature to it. Watch That Man is an excellent opener. Ziggy is more of like a straight up rock and roll album, but this one has more influences, obviously with the jazz and everything coming in a little bit. And then you got the fifties doo-wop. So I like that more variety coming in here. And I think the band is more loose and wild, which I really kind of like here. Vlad and saying the song is really cool. I love that level of like paranoia and weirdness that comes in. You know, it's just got one of my favorite, most unique vibes to a song ever. Driving Saturday, it's got that doo-wop 50s milkshake love flavor. Cracked actor is really dirty and heavy. So just like, it's just got all this variety. I used to be with Joe where I thought the, the sore spot on this was the Stones cover, but now I like it. Time comes in with the perfect amount of menace to shake up the album. Um, I just think it's got such cool flavor. It's maybe the easiest Bowie album to listen to other than maybe Let's Dance because everything's nice and short and sweet. And everything you get in every song is straight up, you know, no facade. It's just like, here's our weird jazz piece. Here's our rock. Here's Gene Genie. Closes with Lady Grinning Soul. I just love the soulful weirdness of this album. I think it's tremendous. I think it's like, you know, compared to Z Ziggy, I think this one's a little bit more artistic and it doesn't um, rely on just like the straight up rock nature, which is also what makes Ziggy awesome. But I just think kind of the bizarreness of the album is just so unique. It's such a tapestry of different things. And I love it. Um, so we all went with the old glam rock era. Well, for me, Aladdin Sane is like literally 0. 0.1 behind Scary Monsters and, and Hunky Dory. They're so close that, uh, I mean, I, I can't say that's not a great pick. All right, man, what a haul. My final thought for David Bowie, just as I said that Ziggy has cemented itself in my top 10 albums. David Bowie is a slam dunk top 10 artist for me as well. Love the week a lot. I'd say slam dunk top 20. It's hard. It's just so hard, but eight five-star albums is, I mean, among the most anyone, I, how much, I mean, I don't know anyone off the top of my head that I have eight five stars for. It's, it's all downhill from here. Everything else is going to suck in comparison. I'm not looking forward to anything else. So he's ruined me, ruined me forever. It will be interesting doing Roxy music so close to Bowie and, and seeing how they kind of compare. That will be coming next week. If you were not yet aware of that, you can check down in the video description to see what is on deck for the next four weeks. And yeah, just uh, let us know what you think of our list, how you rank Bowie's records. Drop it down in the comments. Hit the like button, subscribe, hit the bell for notifications. We've also got Patreon now and a merch store. Those are in the description as well. Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, our website. Links all day in the video description. Thank you, everybody, for watching. We're going on like three hours of this recording session already. Hopefully, I can get this video down to about two hours for you. But I think it's going to be our longest yet. Hope, hopefully you made it this far. Thanks if you did. And we'll see you in the next one.